in the beginning of the February meeting is specifically earmarked for a opportunity to gauge feedback from the public on ESSER dollars. Now I know not everyone is familiar with ESSER and in education we've got far too many acronyms but what ESSER stands for is Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund, E-S-S-E-R. The um, code word for it is in so many ways the coronavirus aid or COVID aid. So we've talked about this before. So some of the slides you're going to see are familiar. There are three rounds of S or three rounds of ESSER plus an A and a B in the second ESSER. So as you see on the screen here, ESSER 1, ESSER 2, A and B, and then ESSER 3. ESSER round, round 1 uh, has been encumbered long time ago now. $135,117, one of the very long list of things you could spend that on was on payment for staff. So we use that money to pay for clubhouse staff. ESSER 2, it lined up. It wasn't the most fortuitous happening, but our HVAC system at the elementary school uh, failed or was very close to having failed. So that money for ESSER 2 one of the allowable expenses was to improve ventilation systems. And remember, the uh, HVAC system at the elementary was original to the building. So by my math, that makes it 54 years old. So it was way overdue. So we spent every dime that we had in ESSER 2 on that HVAC system. That is thankfully been complete. And the ventilation at the elementary school has probably never been better since it was first installed some 50 plus years ago. So that brings us to ESSER 3. Our very most recent total for ESSER 3 dollars is 1.229 million and 433 and change there. That's up slightly from uh, when we met last. Last week we got an upgrade on the amount of dollars we would receive. So that's the new total. So for ESSER 3 we must encumber that or spend that by the end of September 2024. Uh, remember, in lieu of state aid, we've received ESSER dollars. We don't get any state aid for per pupil this year or next year until the next biennium budget, which is 2023 to 2025. So we have to spend that money basically in the next three years. Emphasis on assessing and addressing learning loss. We missed some five months of instruction with the spring of 2020 and the fall of 2020. We were not in school. so we were not able to educate kids in the same way we ordinarily would because obviously they were remote, they were at home. We need to gather feedback from the folks that are um, our stakeholders, students, families, school administration, teachers, principals, school leaders, etc. That is one of the focuses of this evening. ESSER timeline, the window opened on the 6th of December and they give us 90 days, so they have basically rounded it up, if you will. They, they are giving us until March 11th of 2022, which is some six weeks away from today, to document how we're going to spend that money. Possible ESSER expenditures. What you see here on the screen is a very long list of items. Isn't new. These are all items that we already have in-house in most cases. This is not an exhaustive list, but nearly an exhaustive list. Nearly every single one of these is an instructional resource for kids. So if we wanted to, you could use ESSER dollars to pay for any number of these things this year and next year. If you wanted to get something entirely new altogether, we could do that too. But if there was something newer and better, it's likely that it would already be on the list because we wouldn't be waiting around. We would have already tried to grab it. But this is a list of possible ESSER expenditures. These are all, again, if you want to use another acronym, the DPI, these are all EBIs, evidence-based instruction. Staffing considerations. There's a couple of items that I threw on the list that are very new in the last couple of weeks. An additional third grade teacher. Uh, we've got a third grade population uh, in a third grade staff that doesn't match, as in we have more kids and more need than we do the number of staff in third grade here at the intermediate school. 
So we could use these dollars to pay for an additional third grade instructor if we wanted to this year and next year. Uh, we're looking at doing a change in the high school schedule to a year-long math and a year-long English model. We would need additional math instructor to make that happen, so you, we could do that. And then lastly, student success coordinators. Yes, we already have those in district, but we could use this money to pay for those folks. Remember, student success coordinators, they're not career counselors, but rather they're working with kids directly on social and emotional needs. And frankly, the bigger hurt, if you will, from COVID might very well be the social and emotional uh, impacts on kids as opposed to the academic <coughs> ones. Because oftentimes the social and emotional comes first and then the learning comes next. So those are staffing considerations. And lastly, there are some technological considerations. And I do have to apologize for a mistake on this slide. Cybersecurity is an option. Uh, there are entire districts that have been hit by cybersecurity attacks and have been shut down. Nina actually has been closed down for almost a week, meaning they don't have any technology on campus whatsoever in any of their buildings. And Nina is a very large district. So that's something we could do to have better security here. And I, the mistake I made was staff computers. I found out late in the day today from Clint, we can't use this money to pay for staff computers because the E-rate from the federal government doesn't let you mix the $2 pools, but you could do uh, better wireless with this money. So that's an option as well. So these are potential expenditures. These are not anything that's been decided. These are just suggestions. So I'll turn it over to you if you have questions or feedback, and then certainly to the public if they have suggestions of what they would like to see us do. Do any of our administrators have anything to add to this that they'd like to comment on? <clears throat> um, as it pertains to the need for more math instruction, obviously it's one of the main areas that we're assessed on. One thing that you have to look at is the ebb and flows of the number of students that you have in the a building at any given time, so that does impact things a little bit as well. Um, currently our algebra classes, which make up a significant part of our um, ninth and 10th grade, as well as the, the ACT uh, assessments, algebra is a huge focus. You know, Our average algebra class right now is 28. This spring we're gonna have an algebra class that'll run twice with 30 students in it. So to be able to not only instruct algebra, but also to get around and work with those kids on an individual basis is, is very challenging. Um, you know, sometimes it doesn't work out that way where the class sizes are always at large, but math has been pretty large this year. And so, um, you know, we're, we're doing the best, but it's, it's a large class. So I guess, do you guys have any questions about that as it pertains to the high school? Why is math, I mean, it said talked about hiring another math teacher, but why not English? We already have four English teachers. We only have three and a decimal math teachers. Mr. Bosley teaches about 80% science and 20% math. Okay. So. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and so you're talking about putting math, making math and English year round just for, just for ninth and 10th graders or for so, everyone? So the, the plan probably with ninth grade only probably next year and I would say from a math standpoint pre-algebra and algebra and English 9 and then possibly a, a English or a, I'm sorry a ninth grade social studies class just to mix and match the schedule a little bit the 10th grade gets a little bit more complicated because some students we have for instance 9th, 10th, and 11th graders that are in geometry, which is the next class after algebra, that complicates things a little bit. And if we, if we make too many changes, it's hard to hold together the integrity of the block. So I think we're leaning towards sliding in with the 9th grade, checking the data, see what the results come out with, and then possibly working our way in. One other thing that we're possibly looking at doing, which really maybe doesn't necessarily impact the assessment score so much, is 10th grade AP United States history, the possibility of running that as a year-long course for our 10th graders, and then we would have to pair that up more than likely with like a 10th grade English class or something. So we're, we're trying to be creative in solving some problems. Talk for a moment, Josh, about freshman kid takes math, 
sophomore kid takes math, same kid, what could be the gap and when they get sure, math? Sure, if, if, if you take algebra as a first semester freshman and then you don't take geometry, it's possible that you wouldn't take it till the second semester of your 10th grade year. Or let's talk in terms of ACT. Let's say you take algebra one as a ninth grader, let's as the first semester, you take geometry your first semester of your sophomore year, but then you don't take advanced algebra two until the spring of your junior year. That's a, that's a big gap between your math sections and that huge ACT test um, in March. We've actually heard the concern from students themselves. Sure. I, I have. <clears throat> I'm sure you have as well. Um, Kids are very strategic in where they place their, their yeah. math because of that. Yeah. Um, because it's it's happened to some kids that I know that just mm -hmm. for whatever reasons other scheduling issues they couldn't they couldn't get in so moving forward to make that <clears throat> into a year-long back to a year-long course the way it used to be years ago that would be then skinny courses back to skinny courses we wouldn't have that on a block schedule then for the algebra course in the pre-algebra yes it would fit into a skinny schedule that I've kind of mocked up it it works out pretty well um, at least on paper and then that would guarantee that all ninth graders go the entire school year and have year-long math. Um, have we had feedback from teachers or <clears throat> even some of the students? I know some of the students are frustrated with having that gap, but then the good thing about block scheduling, especially in a math setting, is you get that time to be in the classroom, to get the extra help that you need if, if so warranted, and to have that time to work on it versus where you're going to eat up a lot of instruction time with the 60 minute or 50 45 minute, minute class 44 45 minute class minutes. so yeah. you're going to eat up all of that 45 minutes almost in instruction yep. there, in there are positives and negatives to both of those schedules and <clears throat> there's there's many wonderful aspects to the block schedule and this is one of those areas where it's son of a gun is there a better way that we can go about doing this and we're gonna we're gonna try to figure out a way to blend those two together is it something you're going to consider just on a trial basis to see if we went back to that to see how it would work? How many years would you give that just as an assessment? I, I, I think from a, from a fairness standpoint to data, you have to give it a minimum of two years. Um, and also not only just looking at the data, but also talking to the students about their experiences in there as well. It seems like really, you know, there's, a, there's several classes. I think some classes were great as block scheduling, but it seems mm -hmm. like there are several classes that would benefit from being year long. And yep. so, you know, like you even mentioned with some AP classes, if you take it in the spring, it's hard to take the test when you haven't been in the class for it, three, it, four it, months. It, it is a challenge. Um, but at the same time, those AP courses, because the AP tests are taken generally the first week of May, you lose an entire month of instruction when you run those courses in the spring. And as someone who taught AP for, you know, 16, 17 years, it was never a stressor getting through the material in the fall. It was a stressor in the spring, but the stressors were changed. For me, it was having review sessions and other times with the kids to come in, whereas in the spring, it's about getting the material done in a timely manner. Um, so the ESSER dollars <clears throat> would help pay for hiring that teacher um, or teachers, if that's the route we chose to go. But for how long? Well, you have ESSER dollars that run through September of 2024. But after that, it would become a budget item. If you want to continue that, I don't know that you want to do something for two years. I would think you'd want to do something for a lot longer than that, particularly if it works. And I, I'm pretty certain it's going to. The middle school ran the schedule Josh is talking about for nearly 15 years. And 15 years in a row, we were first in math and first in English. We went away from that schedule for four years. We move to the bottom half of the conference. We move back to the schedule, we're first again. So we got a lot of evidence in the middle school. Right. And so is that something that we could long-term look to the budget to support that? Yes, uh, but I can't say what's going to happen with the state budget right. if I could. I can't tell what's going to happen with the state budget next month, let alone three years from now. I know. So, yes, absolutely. We would have to make it work. You can't. You can't do it any other way. If you're just going to do something for two years, I don't think that's going to be sustainable. Anything else on the high school part of it? Not at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. 
I can speak to the third grade staffing consideration. So currently at the elementary, the second grade section is one of our larger sections. It has 6.5 sections. Um, transitioning here next year, we have four teachers. Um, half of us, one section would stay there. That's our Montessori, our third grade stays there. So we would have 5.5 um, transitioning over here and we have four third grade positions here. This is a historically low academic class, challenging. Um, they are our first COVID kindergartners. And so I, I would speak to, in, in my opinion, it probably has impacted them the most. Kindergarten really <coughs> is where you're learning your phonemic and phonological, all the, all the foundational skills that you hear about, that really is where they learn them. Um, so last year I was part of that first grade teaching staff that taught them it was a decision to add another section so the class sizes could be smaller. If we wouldn't have added a section, it would have been in the low 20s. Adding a section has enabled us to stay between 16 and 17 per classroom. Um, so Sean and I have just had the, con had the conversation, even looking at their fall data, they are tracking lower academically. And so I had a conversation with Sean just out of concern with them transitioning over here to four teachers. What is that going to look like for us? How can, we, how can we support them? What would the class size look like with four teachers? Well, the class size that they start at 119, which is where they are right now, and then you pair off about 30 kids that go into Montessori and AIM. That puts you down at 89. 89 split with four teachers is 22, 23, 24. If you add a fifth teacher, it's more like 17 or 18. I don't teach third grade, and I never have, but I am guessing there is a world of difference between 17 and 23 in a classroom. Oh, yeah. And especially with a, kid, a, a group of kids that have a documented need from a worldwide pandemic. They are, they're being called in the literature, COVID kids. They are. They missed five months of instruction when they needed it most. It, for them, it was probably one of the most sensitive times of their early education of learning how to read. And then really that impacts their writing. The elementary, last year we implemented a lot of things I can speak to. I know that Cheryl is. I know we really upped title. I know there was very purposeful classing. When, when they made classes, it was very purposeful um, so that supports could go in and push in students. Um, some of the ideas that were up on the board earlier actually were adopted at the elementary for those students. Hegarty is a program um, that we implemented middle of last year. Once we saw what the test scores were on FastBridge, we immediately responded. It's something now that is being used universally at the elementary. We're actually using it here universally as well, just to do some backfilling. That's really what we're finding is we're having to go back and do a lot of backfilling. Do you guys have any other questions about this incoming third grade group? Not surprising. Yeah, I agree. Totally not surprising. I agree. Well, and you tend to have classes, certain classes that do have more need. Right. You know, and so it could be that they have more need and you had the COVID. It definitely could know, be that combination. Together. Absolutely. Yeah. Thing, so. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Yep. So, what was I going to say? So, I guess if we're not getting, if we're not getting the state funding, how much of this money do we need to use just to make budget? Well, we're going to need to use a, a large portion of it, but the law says you must spend at least 20% of it on learning loss. I don't have a calculator right in front of me, but 1.2 million at 20% is about 250,000, and the rest is going to be used to fill budget. So, and we've already got ideas on how to do that because there's already known expenses that go on and on and on for year right. after year. So we're not talking about necessarily trying to figure out how to spend. No. All that, you know, we are not, a million. We are not you're marking $1.2 million here in the next two months. I think that would be unwise. We have to use that to correct to just pre ordinary pay. budget expenses, right? Yeah. Right, which is disappointing because it would have been nice to use that for well, other, you know extra things, but that's and then the way it worked. And then a lot of these things we're already <laughs> using, so yes, so the ESSER dollars. I mean, even that 20% that we need to use towards learning loss, we can say we're using it for these things that are yes. already in our in our budget now you just have to you just have to declare that's what you're doing with it yeah right yes but i mean i don't think it's going to be hard to find that 20 percent because no already, that list that list of 50 is is a big sum a right. big sum of money i don't know exactly right. how much but a lot right and we're we are redoing the ela yep curriculum so that's going to be that's a, big a curriculum order the curriculum order is one hundred and forty thousand dollars. 
The timeline on that doesn't line up real well because we won't have that decision until the end of March, and this needs to be declared by March 11th, but it could still be done if we had to. The 1.2 million is for the two years. Yes, not so not each year. Not each two year. years. Yeah. And, so. and I will say, on top of that, yes, the budget's due uh, on that date, but they're allowing for like any other grant revisions to a budget. So, I mean, obviously we're gonna have an idea and a framework of where we want to do. So, but there's some flexibility beyond that date. So, I think that's good too. So. So do, are we just opening the microphone to yes. anyone that wants to speak from the community yep. as far as recommendations or things that they would like to see us address? Yes, anyone whoever, have? if anyone has anything. Yeah, certainly. if anyone would like to add on that, this is the time to talk about this, and this is for the ESSER dollars. It's not for any other issue before the board. It's just this time frame is what we put out for that. Um, I think the administrator people have done a great job of laying it out. Sure. Uh, the things that we can use to spend it on and the things that uh, we need to spend it on. I mean, I think we could spend like four times this amount. <laughs> I mean, really, just Probably. because, yeah. you know, especially with just having most of it needing to go to our budget, I would love to see us, you know, hire another math teacher and hire another third grade teacher and, and look at our cybersecurity and see if that really needs to get shored up and... I mean, I'd love to do all of it, but I, I you sure. know, I don't know that yeah. that's we can do all of it. So I don't know. And quite I guess. honestly, that was probably the intent of the federal government for schools to use it, obviously to address you know the pandemic and things. State had other ideas, so that's kind of where right, which is <coughs> really right. discouraging. Yeah, because roughly we'd be looking at about 110,000 for the loss of the 150 per pupil state aid. I'd have to run the math on that. I'm just thinking that would be a 1,500 ballpark. students at about 8,000, roughly. It doesn't quite work like that, but. No, it doesn't quite work like that. No. You, know. you, you could safely say 100, 150, 200,000 in state aid. You could yeah. say that. Yeah. Not just for us, for everybody. Everyone, yes. Yeah. In others, the price tag is different. River Falls has more kids than us. Right, yeah. right. So feasibly, what? How much of this can we tackle, I guess, is I'm kind of wondering. Well, the, the goal is to address the 20%. Yeah. After that, you don't have to declare any of it. You simply use it where you need to use it. So we're focused on the 20%. Right. And just to clarify a little bit, that there are some other small percentages, a little bit for summer school. You've got it for summer school. And then I, I forget the other little bit you have to use for some other. After school yeah, programs. After school, that was it, yes. After Five percent for after school programs. A little one percent for like the summer school. So, okay, yeah. yeah. So reasonably, can we? Do we have enough to hire? You know, I'm. I mean, I guess it would cover for two years because that's all it's going to be for. If you did a third grade teacher and a fifth in a high school math teacher through S or dollars, it depends on who you hire. But if you wanted to guesstimate, you could say a teacher is salary plus benefits. Call it somewhere between 65 and 75 for each of them. Double that and then double it again because it's for two years. You'd get yourself out right around 250, 275. So, yes, that would be clean. That would be quick math to do that. But by no means are we ready to make that decision here this evening. But, yes, we could. Looks like we have a comment. <clears throat> I'm looking for some clarification. Um, for the, on the DPI website, it says that the LEAs are required to reserve at least 20% of ESSER three funds for evidence-based intervention strat strategies and ensure that those in interventions respond to students' social, emotional, and economic needs and address the, dis the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on underrepresented student subgroups. What are the student subgroups that we have to cover in this 20% and why is this it's calling that out specifically. For the, for the second grade move. Okay. Julie, can you pull your microphone down a little bit so we can hear you, please? Thank okay. you. For the second grade students moving into third grade, third grade, we have benchmark testing done throughout their first grade year, their second grade year, and they are very easily identified. I would imagine we could print a list as quick as you could get to FastBridge. For the high school kids, you could document that need 
in the same way by looking at their performance as eighth graders and ninth graders. We could print that list out just as quickly, very likely. So the, the student success counselors will be helping out who then if we have teachers covering those specific needs? The well, third grade the, in the, the fast bridge data would be academic performance data, but I imagine the social and emotional data for second grade students would probably parallel that very closely because they're probably having struggles there too. But there's not data, if you will, that have social and emotional impact. That's not as quickly as identified as an academic data point. So they, uh, I'm, what is the student success coordinator going to be doing then with the children? Uh, the student success coordinator would continue to be doing what they've always been doing, which provides academic, social, and emotional support at school. But the conversation we were having was about identifying kids via academic need, social and emotional learning via student success coordinator. I didn't know that that was part of the conversation. That, well, that was, was simply one of the a consideration. Under staffing considerations. Sure, that's a consideration. But yeah. I didn't know that we were talking about that quite yet. Yeah, well, we already have those folks in place. We could simply pay for their salaries through ESSER dollars. But if we're doing a third grade teacher and you're doing a math teacher, you're already out to 275. If you're then going to do student success coordinator salaries for the people that are already here, you're probably looking at more likely another 300 to 350. We're probably going way beyond where we need to have all of those staff through ESSER dollars. We don't have that kind of money to do just through ESSER dollars. Thank you. And we we want to be mindful, I would think, of when we're making this decision about staffing, that this is sustainable within the budget for several years to come instead of just what this covers um, so that we can have a real impact, I would think. So um, that's obviously more that we're going to have to look at moving forward with hiring people. I, I have a real issue with hiring people just out of grant money and, and you know, COVID money or wherever the money's come from, and then we have to let them go because it's not sustainable in the long-term budget because that's, that doesn't seem like a, a good sustainable plan, so. Did that answer your question about those specific groups? About. Yeah, I was yeah. wondering how that. I the same concern with you as well, so I kind of look at it from that, from a financial standpoint, I look at because that's my <clears throat> I'm sorry, my Andy, area. The, front, the first part of that. Oh, I said I, I share your concern of that too with, with uh, being able to support that going forward and it's, you know, my, my uh, area of hopefully expertise to know hopefully what the state's going to do the next biennium. And, and I'm hoping that they're going to restore things, but there's nothing for certain. So. Thank you. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you. Something. I don't know exactly how many years. How long have the student Two, success right? coordinators been here? Uh, four or five. I couldn't say exact. Year, and the teacher would cover like middle school, or how you have three of them to go between the four schools? Two. There's two now. You're two. saying if so we wanted to add one, another one. one. We're, not, we're not proposing adding any. Yeah. We're proposing if we used ESSER dollars, you could pay for the two existing ones with ESSER dollars. We're not proposing adding any. So we don't, then they, we lose those? Then? Nope. No. They're in the budget. We yeah. pay for them through the budget in the same way we have for the last four or five years. ESSER just gives you another option of how you pay for them, so we but we're not adding any. We're using right. the ESSER dollars to cover that salary, and then we'd have that money in the budget to cover other things. So, so well, then you're just, but you're not, then you're not necessarily doing anything new. You're just allocating the money and. If that's the route we went, it wouldn't be new. If we, right. That is true. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's kind of the end of our uh, presentation there with the ESSER funding. How, um, how do we proceed as far as like who makes the final decision and how does, you know? Well, we're going to meet again here in February. It's the same format, allow people to give feedback in between the February board meeting and the March 11th date. Andy and I need to get into the portal and put in what we're going to put in. You have to have a narrative justifying the expense. Right now, if you're asking for my recommendation, I would go with the recommendation to add a third grade teacher and the recommendation to add a math instructor because we have academic data that can tell you exactly why we should do that. If you're telling me you've got a third grade kid coming into this, this building next year that missed five months of instruction, I'm going to show you a kid that's probably got an academic need. And that's exactly what we have. 
well, they, I mean, all the kids missed basically five months of in-person instruction, but it seems like it's hitting this class it harder. is hitting this class Some harder. Class. Yes. Well, to, to speaking of what uh, Ms. Ambrosia said, that this that was that that cornerstone of the foundation of how everything gets built is in kindergarten of learning how to to read and sound those things out, and so that's and then mm -hmm. now we have that real evidence based fact that we can see over the last couple of years. We could have guessed that that was going to happen. I mean, just if we're educated enough to know how how it works, but then to see it actually happen with the fast bridge and um, what a what a great program that's been for us as a mm -hmm. district to purchase because we've really been able to key in on, on the deficits that we have and, and act fast. The learning loss that's been demonstrated statewide, elementaries and intermediates have seen a ton of learn learning loss in English language arts. Middle schools have seen a ton of learning loss in math because it's about direct instruction. If they're not here, you can't provide direct instruction. And reading is a direct instruction activity. And that didn't happen for almost five months. Yeah. Um, and it, it, obviously, we're going to we'll look at this again, just like we have with the well, first ESSER round of dollars and the second round of dollars. And the board will approve it, whatever we do going forward in, a, in another meeting. So. And also, just one final thing. I, I don't want to be lost in the fact that we can budget for this but it's going across a couple of school years. Just remember that too. So right. Actually, three school years. So. Do we need to go see if there's any oh, for the community comments? Yep. Yeah. Well, now we'll move to our regular meeting. Uh, first off, we'll have the consent agenda items. Um, I had the consent agenda items this month, so I will make a motion to approve those items. And a second. Second. Shar. All those in favor, say aye. 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 That is done. I've been waiting for Becky to find out if we have any community comments. Okay. There isn't any? Right. Okay. Um, due to a drive and that, uh, we'll have uh, before our administrative uh, team, Jonathan uh, Sherwood from Clifton Larson Allen will give us our audit report. You meant to say because everyone's so excited about the audit report. That's <laughs> what you meant to say. Like What's that? I like the mask. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so uh, thank you for having me here tonight. My name is Jonathan Sherwood. I'm a manager with Clifton Larson Allen. Um, I'm in charge of the day-to-day the -day running of the typical field work of the audit. I uh, help pull together the whole financial report form for you uh, and then guide everything through issuance. So I do have a, a big level of people that are both above me and below me. Um, the people that work below me definitely help me uh, accumulate all of the information that we use to compile the financial statements and issue our audit report. And then the people above me keep me out of trouble and make sure that if there's any glaring errors in my mistakes, hopefully all of them get caught before we issue our final uh, audit report for you. So if there's any questions, um, as I go through my audit report, I'm gonna use a two-page summary that we usually pull together every year. Um, that way I don't have to go through the full 88 pages of your financial statements and keep everybody here until a very late hour. So um, to get things started, I guess, um, Again, if there's any questions from board members as I go through things, please stop me as I go through. Uh, a couple of items here for you just to, um, before I start on my comments on actual financial information, I just want to highlight a couple of the individual reports that we actually issue, as well as um, the management letter findings that we issue on an annual basis as well for you. Uh, but first off, I want to thank Andrew and all the admin staff that I come in here once a year and kind of harass a little bit to you know, kind of get in their way and say, I need this, I need this. And they do a great job of pulling everything together for us and uh, maintaining in whatever DPI requirements are, uh, they definitely help us in completing our job in an efficient manner for us. So very much appreciated. Uh, so on-site work this, this year went as smoothly as possible with the ever... Um, you know, issue of COVID Im impacting on-site visits, masking requirements, are we allowed on-site, are we not? Uh, we've made tremendous strides in working remotely as well, which is definitely, um, you know, kind of the silver lining in my book, uh, dealing with COVID, because uh, it do definitely does reduce the, some of the travel that we need from our end, and, and then basically does um, speed up the process overall uh, working remotely, uh, believe it or not. So from that standpoint, I really appreciate uh, everything that the district's done uh, to help us issue our audit report. So the first item that I have for you on our two-page summary here is the actual auditor's uh, report or the opinion. 
So that's the only part of the audit report that's actually ours of CLAs. We issue what's known as an unmodified or a clean opinion. So that's the highest level of assurance that we're able as an exter ex external auditor to actually issue, which is our goal and that's what we strive for. And honestly, that's what DPI is gonna require us to do uh, for, for the district to, to achieve that level of independence uh, uh, opinion. So we're happy to report that that's the opinion that we are able to issue again this year. Um, along with our audit report, we also issue what's known as a management letter, uh, management letter comments. So these two items that I have here listed, um, they're, they're known as material weaknesses in the auditor world or auditor speak, but these are recurring items that have been uh, very common to most people on the board here. Uh, and it's something that we've, we've issued uh, time and time again. These items are required for us to be commenting on to um, the, the Board of Governance here. Uh, not, neither of these two issues are gonna be any glaring red flags by any means, but they're required for me to at least discuss briefly here for you tonight. Uh, the first item is limited segregations of duties uh, for a school district your size, school district of Emory's size, very, very common. Uh, just goes to look at how many folks are involved in your financial reporting department, your admin staff, um, even with as many duties of the transaction cycle separated as we have them, um, we don't have backups in place for multiple, multiple people. So your admin section, your finance section is so small that you're saying we have to have compensating controls in order to oversee and review the type of work that they're performing. So this is the time that I usually highlight everybody that's sitting around uh, in a school, school board chair and saying you're an integral part in the district's internal controls. Every time that you do your agenda items where you're approving vouchers, approving administrative reports, that is a key internal control that if there are questions that they're being raised by the right people, uh, and definitely uh, give Andrew a little bit more of a hard time and say we need to see some support for certain invoices or all of your budget discussions that you have. You know, the, the great community input that we had here on how ESSER funds are being uh, discussed and how they're ultimately going to be spent, that's definitely integral in your internal controls of the district. So from an internal or external auditor's uh, experience of showing up to board members or board meetings, we, we appreciate seeing things like that. So keep those things up. Um, the other item on here is uh, material audit adjustments. That basically simply means that through the course of our audit work, we're proposing adjustments to the district's books in order to compile the 88 page or almost 90 page uh, audit report here for you in order to get things <clears throat> into DPI's required prescribed forms, as well as following generally accounting uh, accepted practices to make sure that everything is you know, on the up and up. Uh, and I'll obviously highlight a few things here for you uh, going forward in that regard. Uh, overall, uh, as far as the terms of the number of adjustments that we've made, uh, pretty, it's pretty standard of what, we're, what, what I've experienced for the School District of Amory in the last number of years. Slightly up this year, that's kind of due to some of the, the changes in accounting principles that took place during the year, as well as some major changes of DPI's required reporting changes as far as account structure and a bunch of boring stuff that you don't have to worry about. But that's one of the reasons why we had slightly more journal entries this year as compared to years past. Um, so ever the continuing strive of improvements, I know Andrew and I will have uh, quite a few comment or emails flying back and forth throughout the year and I can definitely help along with uh, interpreting any DPI final changes that come up through the year as well. So moving on from there, um, since the district also gets a certain level of federal funding, we have to issue what's known as a single audit report or a, a report over compliance. And that takes a look at both your specific federal programs, including ESSER and that kind of things coming up, as well as all your state programs as well. So we have to do a compliance audit to make sure that what we're spending that money on at the district level is approved and is in compliance with the overall program guidelines. So uh, we're happy to report there that I've, after, out of all of the federal uh, programs and state programs that we were required to test, we didn't have any compliance findings uh, that we need to report to those reporting agencies, which is obviously your goal. A um, couple other, other items there for you to move through quickly is, again, I mentioned a couple of changes in accounting principles that took place, and you'll see some of those kind of, that the impact of those numbers on page two here, so just catch your breath on that one, you'll see that uh, going forward. Uh, and then some of the other reports that we actually have to issue and just uh, some of the uh, technical things that we have to take care of. You'll see on the PI 1506, that's a DPI required annual filing. Uh, it's a very uh, technical one that Andrew and I have to make sure we're you know, balancing out to the penny. His records match my records. So that's a fun one that he and I get to uh, file annually. 
And then lastly is the federal data collection form. So again, I mentioned that single audit that's required. We have to have a separate reporting package that's you know, a, an annual filing with them to make sure that all of the federal funding is properly documented and reported uh, on our financial statements. Uh, and again, on, on all of those reports, we didn't have any, any additional findings to report for you. So that's a, a highlight for you as well. To move into some of the actual finance uh, um, and financial figures here, item number two is we're going to start with the general fund. And in my cases, when I say general fund for the report, I'm referring to both fund 10 and fund 27, which collectively is your regular and special education activities are all reported in these balances below here. So a couple of things that we look at, we've got a four year trend here when it comes to your balance sheet. So this is a snapshot as of 630, uh, 2021 and the year end balances. So from a perspective of what I look for is trends, which way are these items going from one year to the next? So something that definitely is gonna look uh, or jumps off at the page at you uh, that can be explained is that top line for cash and investments. You can see as of 630, 2021, you've got $4.1 million sitting in the bank. But the reason for that is kind of a cash flow timing issue. If you go down a little bit further under that short term notes payable, you've got about $2 million that was taken out as a short term loan with the line of credit with the bank. That, that there was a big draw that actually occurred right on 630. So the reason that you have kind of a bump up in cash is because we just took it out at the end of the year and it hit our bank account more or less, you know, showing accounting wise, the cash came in and we have to, you know, we owe that balance to the bank. And as you can see, that short term note payable has been outstanding at the end of the year, uh, going back to at least the last three years. So that's been a recurring item that we've had. Um, another new item that you'll see on there, uh, again, just from accounting transaction, this is the way it needed to be reported, is that land held for resale. Uh, the balance isn't very large, but it is a new item, so worth talking or mentioning real quickly. So during uh, 2021, uh, the district went out and spent $350,000 to purchase that land parcel. And due to the nature of what that land parcel was going to be used for, some of it was, was earmarked and said, this is what potential future expansion. So that's known as a capital asset addition. That's not showing up in that balance. This land held for resale were those, those lots essentially that were carved off that the future use was to you know, build a house on, sell that off or whatever, however that program exactly works. Um, that's what that number on there represents. So it, it is an, uh, a balance sheet asset at this point. And as soon as we do those developments, then that'll fall off at that point. So as far as looking at the general fund and when we say, what is the financial health of a district? Uh, there are those three highlighted rows there on this handout that basically are some metrics as to see how we're doing from one year to the next. Uh, so the first line being uh, in the fund balance section. So those are the true reserves of the district. And then we compare that to the total expenditures of what does it take to actually educate or run the district for all its general operations. And then we compute this ratio, this ratio, excuse me, of general unassigned fund balance as compared to total expenses for the year. So we come up with that ratio and in 2021, we have a ratio of 16.2%. So again, that represents as this is what our true reserves are at the end of the year. How long could we basically operate the district um, out of our reserves? So we're saying about 16% of the year of the total expenses we could fund directly out of uh, fund balance and not take in grant dollars, not rely on any borrowing, not rely on any additional property tax collection. Um, that ratio is when you look at it is okay, where, where do we fall as compared to our other peers in Western Wisconsin? So in our experience at CLA, we do quite a few districts in the area, 25, 27 in this part of the state. Um, the district average that we see is usually between 25 and 30%. Uh, and that is uh, typically what we would recommend also from an uh, external auditor perspective of what, it, what would you consider a healthy district? That would be anywhere between 25 and 30%. You know, we, ideally as a goal, it would be you know, three to four months of operating expenses in your unassigned fund balance that you could quote unquote live on uh, if that need would arise. So that would be, you know, that would we, we consider that to be a very healthy or financially stable district. Um, the, the Amory School District as a district policy has that, that that limit should be at a minimum 5%. And in the district policy, this goes back, I'd have to look at exactly when that was adopted many, many years. 
Um, the, the actual terminology in there is that if you would get anything 5% or below, it would be cause for concern and immediate action would need to be taken place at the budgeting level. So you're clearly meeting your district policy of at least 5% and you're actually exceeding that. From an external auditor standpoint, I don't have any concerns that you're at quote unquote only 16%. So I would say you are financially healthy at this point. You know, you're, you're able to fund your operations. However, as a goal is what I would say is kind of what you, you should strive for would be to, to increase that to about 20, uh, 25% uh, overall. Um, the reason that I would say that from my perspective that that would be important in future budget cycles if you're able to get to that level is it would definitely eliminate or reduce the need to short-term borrow throughout the year. So you can see obviously like I mentioned earlier, you've had short-term borrowing needs uh, just to, due to property tax collections and grant allocations and that, that sort of thing. So that would eliminate that which to the tune of I think maybe thirty or forty thousand dollars in interest at times can be paid out during the year. So that would be an interest cost you would save. Uh, then the other issue or the other um, benefit of increasing your fund balance is it, it opens up the, the world of uh, liquidity for you as far as gives you options if you have any f uh, future capital needs. So if you've got some big capital items that need to be taken care of in the future, um, you could partially finance that then, you know, yourself, potentially reduce the amount that you would need to borrow, ultimately interest savings down the road. So that's the reason why you would kind of shoot for a target at 25 to 30% if in future budget cycles it's possible. Uh, I just wanna make sure I don't have any other things to say on the general fund. Any questions about the general fund before I move on to everything else, uh, all the other operations? Um, then moving on to page two here for you, uh, item number three is what's known as your special revenue funds. So these are separate activities that are tracked separately and they have a special or a designated revenue stream that's restricted to use for those specific operations. And you will see right off the top that that education trust fund or fund 21, if that's how you know that fund, uh, that significantly increased during 2021. And that is a direct result of that change in accounting principle that I mentioned earlier. It's also known as GASB 84 if you wanna go stay up late and read the whole 72 page announcement, pronouncement. Uh, but basically what it means is we had a lot of funds tracked into fund 60, your, your student activity funds, as well as your, your scholarship funds, this fund 72s, that they, they used to be allowed to be tracked there for accounting purposes and under DPI regulations. Well. The GASB came in, the accounting standards uh, setting board agency, and they said, you have to track these differently. We have some different reporting requirements. Basically what that meant is we dissolved all those funds and we have to track them separately. And DPI said, they go into fund 21. So there are, a, you know, that's part of the, of the, a lot of the conversation that Andrew and I had during the year is how do we make this work? How do we still track these separately, but follow DPI's guidance? Well, we moved all the funds into 21. So you can see that there's a significant balance sitting there, but those are restricted balances set aside for those specific funds and they're all being tracked within, to, within your Skyward system and they can only be used for those specific purposes. So that's the reason why that one increased significantly. Uh, your other uh, two funds here, the two um, types of funds there, food service is obviously your fund 50. Um, so long as that is making money or keeping itself afloat, that's what DPI is gonna require. And also that's what the federal government is gonna be re requiring with those free and reduced lunch uh, programs flowing through there as well. Uh, then the other one is your community service fund or funds, your fund 80s. So that comprises of your adult education, your theater program, and then your daycare program. So really the, the, the two of them that are in the negative, as you can see, the, those were operating at a loss for a few years there. Um, definitely COVID reared its head in 2020 there and um, your, your daycare facilities really did take a, a very big hit in 2020. So you can see that was significantly down in 2020 and that change, it's moving towards the positive here in 2021. Um, and the reason for that is that first round of CARES funding, and that's where those funds were received in, and that's where the, that activity was recorded. So in your specific daycare fund, in your fund 80s, it was about $135,000 in federal funding that went into that fund to help it recover from its losses it experienced in 2020. Uh, I, I don't believe there was very, there was, uh, very little activity in the theater fund overall. And then the other one is your adult education fund, which when it comes to these funds, they need to be breaking even or making a profit. 
Otherwise, there should be additional discussion as to what type of services are we providing. If they're operating at a loss, do we need to increase our fees to support those, or do we need to abandon some of those services? Those are the tough conversations that a board would have to have in your fund 80s specifically. Uh, the other option is you could also then support those if they are operating at a loss and they are desired activities, you could support those with additional property tax levy directed specifically for those items. So that's how you would inc you know, improve the, f the operations of those funds. Uh, moving on to the debt service fund is item number four here for you. Uh, this is all of the principal and interest payments are recorded separately and recorded to be tracked uh, in its own standalone fund. So this is the reserves at the end of the year is about $500,000. So those, that balance is restricted and will be used to meet future debt service needs. Uh, you'll see it, it did dramatically decrease from the 2020 balance. And that's simply a, a function of when the, the bonds and when the, the notes are due. As soon as one debt issuance falls off, it's very common to see that balance significantly decreased. And that's exactly what happened in 2021, is you've had one of your long-term bond issuances, and you'll see that later on, uh, was paid off and it fully matured, so you didn't have to have any future payments now in 2022, because it's all, it was completely extinguished, so you didn't have to have any reserves on hand to be supported in order to make those payments. Um, so again, this debt service is both your referendum debt and your non-referendum debt, Fund 39 and Fund 38, are together in this report here. Uh, and you only have one issuance, I believe, left in your referendum debt at this point uh, of 630-2021. Uh, the next item here for you is item number five are your capital projects funds. And in this case, this is your long-term capital projects fund that was started a number of years ago, I think six or seven years ago when that first uh, became an option with DPI. You set aside these funds. They needed to remain in here for a period of time. You couldn't touch them until you had a long-term capital plan on file with DPI and a certain time period had expired. I believe now you are able to actually access those funds and use them for capital replacement items. Uh, the only activity that occurred in 2021 is just the interest that was earned on that balance. Uh, the last item I have here for you then is the long-term debt obligations. So this is just a summary of all of the debt that is outstanding as of 6-30-2021. So a couple of items again just to highlight your general obligation bonds uh, that there was that one debt issuance that fell off so the remaining balance is $300,000 in that category that that'll be due through 2023 is when you'll have I, I believe two more payments, two more annual payments and then that one will be completely extinguished. And then you have the general obligation notes. And you did have some activity in that general obligation note category. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, that $350,000 was uh, taken out to purchase the, the land parcel. So that's the category that that fell under. Um, and then obviously you had additional payments that were due throughout the year on some of those other issuances. So the, the net result is you've got $547,000 outstanding in general obligation notes. Um, and those notes are due, um, those payments will be good through 2024 on one issuance, and then the 350000 that was taken out during the year is going to be due in 2028. So in total, as far as debt payments go during 2021, uh, you paid a to, to the tune of $1.56 in principal and interest payments were made during 2021. So you're... you're required debt, uh, debt obligations were met during the year, which is obviously uh, a requirement. Uh, a couple other items to highlight then for you as far as what else is out there for debt obligations. Um, very active here at uh, School District of Amory is that capital lease line. Uh, you can see that it did ultimately decrease from last year's 2020 balance of 353,000, uh, but you had 184,000 that's due um, at the end of 2021 with that, uh, there was a new lease that was signed during the fiscal year. And that was for the purchase or the, the lease agreements of um, I believe uh, computer equipment, IT equipment. And that lease will expire in 2023. Um, and those uh, at that time will either be assets of the district or turned back in uh, with very little uh, residual value at the end of those. 
Uh, when it comes to debt, the other thing to keep in mind, the last section here for you, is the state of Wisconsin has that statutory requirement as to what your legal debt authorization limit is, uh, which is 10% of all the equalized value within the district. Uh, from a school district standpoint, it's very unlikely that you would ever get to 100% of that limit. Uh, tax rates would just obviously not fall in line. Um, so that's why typically when you look at any district, a highly leveraged or a, a district with a lot of debt would be around 20, 30%, 35% even of that debt limit. And that typically occurs when you have a very large new school uh, building or something like that with a lot of renovations, a lot of debt that's issued. You can see here at, at Amory, we're actually in a very luxurious position of 0.8% of that legal debt limit. Um, so from a standpoint of Looking at the statutory limit, you have capacity available should you need to have any long-term capital needs. Um, based on that, that concludes all of my quick items I wanted to highlight um, from a you know, high level here for you. Uh, any questions or anything that I could potentially address for you yet? I guess my question on the previous page was um, under the percentage of unassigned fund balance at 16.2% is that it's up above it says change in fund balance. Is that where our fund balance is as far as dollar amount right now or? So the total fund balance that you're looking at is that first unassigned fund balance of 3.7 million. Okay. Compared to the total expenditures for the year of 23 million. Okay. So that's where we get to the 16.2. Okay. The change in fund balance was just what, what did the total fund balance change from 2020 into 2021? So that would be that 2.7 up to 3.7. Correct. Okay. If you want to look at it from a business standpoint, I'd say that's, we made that much money. I guess. Net income would be another word, yeah. you know. Yeah, that's how much we have in reserve. Correct. Yeah. So I guess I was just wondering, like, if we went up about 4%, that was about a million dollars. So just kind of, kind of keeping in mind of how much we would need to try to continue to go up to get up to 25, that seems like, woo. And it's a moving target because our budget seems to go up every year. So, you know, it's, I like to look at the dollar amount increases more so than percentage, even though percentage is important. But we made strides this last year for a number of reasons, but then, but uh, definitely that's the goal, and one of our strategic goals is to increase our fund balance. Yeah. So. And I'm obviously very cognizant to know, like, obviously you've got ESSER funding that's coming in. You know, you've got budget needs. There's budget constraints. Uh, looking at it, to your point, in order to get to that 25% goal, you're <coughs> looking at roughly $2 million to add to your unassigned fund balance. So I know it could be an unpopular discussion to have of, well, we've got the surplus. How do we spend it? You know, now you've got an auditor that's standing here and saying, well, don't spend it. Let's sock it away and not spend it on anything. There's obviously pluses and minuses for doing it that way overall. Um, but just keep in mind that, you know, if you look at your peer districts in the area, most of them are also at that 25 to 30 percent for various reasons. And some of those are actually spending that down for different reasons as well. You have to dip into it for, for COVID funding and whatnot. So. And I fully think that the fund balance might be a little volatile the next couple of years. So. Just keep that in mind, depending how fast your money is spent and saved. And so we'll see how we come out of it yeah. in a couple of years. Thanks. You, you stated that the average, um, I guess, of our peer school districts are around between 20 and 30 percent. And it seems like our, our policy says a minimum of 5 percent. What, what is the typical minimum? percentage of our peer districts. Sure, areas. yeah, as far as the wording of those fund balance policies goes, they're kind of all over the board. Um, usually it still, they, they'll say that like our target is 15% or 20% as far as what their target is. And then uh, you know, my recommendation is still gonna say, no matter what your policy would stay, from an external reader of, of financial statements, I would still say that my measuring stick would be 25 to 30 percent. But yeah, to your point, as far as what are, what are your other districts saying, uh, it is all over the board as far as what's their minimum policy. Usually somewhere in that 15 percent is what their minimum policy would be. Um, in my experience, the wording of the, of the school district of Amory's fund balance policy, 5 percent is probably one of the lowest that I'll read uh, in my experience. Yeah, and I don't think that policy's been revised in 
at least since I've been on the board for yeah. nine years. Forever, yeah. 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 Again, that's so. uh, my experience is too on those. Is it was a requirement, again, one of those fun uh, accounting principles that changed at one point in time. Uh, I believe it was GASB 54, so we've come a long ways of what, what, that, what that requirement was. You all needed a policy, you know, all the districts needed a policy. One was adopted, and then nobody's changed them since. So how are they generating a 25 to 30 percent fund balance, the other districts? How are they generating it? Um, I mean, obviously, there are different levels of their operations when it comes to what, what are their revenue streams coming into it. Um, a lot of it's property taxes, um, or, or the other side of it is just uh, uh, during 2008 time frame, going all the way back then, as far as when they had to lean down their operations, they really made uh, some significant cuts in expenditures. So that their revenue streams were, you know, given or stated in those state budgets, and then the way they built up the, their fund balances, they reduced expenditures uh, fairly dramatically. Yeah. So they may have overtaxed. Depends. I mean, <laughs> however you want to, <laughs> however you want to look at it. Sure, that's that's one way of obviously answering that question. Just, just putting you on the spotlight here. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Which, you know, I mean, not, the state obviously limits how much we can carry over too. Um, when it comes to the fund balance policy, uh, there's, not a, uh, there's not a limit from a statutory requirement of what you could end up in reserves where the state would step in is your levy limit requirements, how much you could levy in terms of property taxes. Yeah. So that's where their, their controlling thumb gets into that equation. Is they're going to tell you how much you can bring in into that equation versus how, much, how you actually or how you could actually spend it. So. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Jonathan. Anybody else? Nope. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. it. Thanks, John. Safe trip home. Now we'll go back to our administrative reports. All right, we're getting back into the swing of things. Uh, just a couple of events that recently happened outside of the norm. January 10th, our high school honors band. We had a number of students, close to a dozen, participate in a concert at Somerset. Did a wonderful job. January 11th, we sent nine students. Our global, global scholar students went to Minneapolis-St. Paul as part of their certification program. We've got the end of the semester coming up this Friday, so everybody's working hard to take care of the last details in their classes. Uh, future events, um, we do our teacher in service on Monday night, or I'm, I'm sorry, Monday during the day. One of the focuses at the high school will be ninth and tenth grade, ninth and tenth grade curriculum, and double checking the alignment of that with our state assessments and the state standards to make sure that we're doing the best there. Um, February seventh and tenth, we have our ACP um, parent teacher conferences. The primary part of that. Uh, conference format is so that students and their parents and teachers can all get together to look over course offerings for the upcoming school year next year and help the students make good choices about what they want to take for courses. It's not the actual scheduling day or more or less an exploration day to look at all the options for parents to become um, acquainted with what the actual requirements are and it makes for a good conference between student, parent, and child. We have Snow Week coming up January 31st through February 4th. We've got a bunch of fun events scheduled for that. Um, in the immediate future, uh, you know, we are hosting, and I've mentioned this before, a number of huge events coming up. We have the sectional wrestling coming up in February, sectional hockey final in February. We have a girls basketball sectional final, and we have a boys semi as well as sectional final so we have some significant events coming up february 22nd we've got our act boot camp day for our 11th graders uh, ninth and 10th graders will be at home as virtual learners that day we, we're going to do the full court press on our 11th graders giving them as much support as possible and our 12th graders will be going through uh, some presentations in the auditorium so that's the high school any questions All right, at the middle school and intermediate school, we just got done with 
um, a pretty big event, Prairie Fire Theater and the Wizard of Oz. I want to give a lot of credit to Tracy Hendrickson who really coordinates that program along with all the students who pull off a show in, in one week. And I'm always amazed at how hard they work and, and the great job they do. Um, we also uh, just finished up boys basketball and we are heavily into now girls basketball and middle school wrestling. So that's been fun to see those kids perform. Uh, Josh had just mentioned um, some of the registration things happening at the high school. We have freshman registration night, which is for eighth graders and their parents, and that's on uh, January 31st in the evening, and invites went out already for that for parents. Um, it's kind of a three-step process. We have high school counselors that come over and discuss how registration works and some of the ins and outs of the high school schedule and they do that um, during eighth grade during the day um, a week, about a week before and give out some materials for students and then um, we're, we are taking eighth grade over for a tour of programs um, towards the end of the day on the 31st and then the parents come in that evening with their child and learn even more and can answer questions and understand exactly how credits work in the registration process so they can make the best decision for their child. So we're excited about that. Um, we're uh, going to be kicking off our mid-year goal setting with students. Again, students have been setting some individual goals and things that they want to accomplish and they process with advisors on different things that they feel that they can do um, academically and also just uh, personally to uh, work on improving in themselves and um, meeting the goals that they have chosen. So we'll be going through that with our Warrior Time Advisory groups. Um, on February 9th, we kick off Genius Hour and we're really excited for that again. Um, Genius Hour is a program that basically says um, we want our kids to learn to research, develop, um, present on various topics and rather than sit down and say well here's the topic you have to present everyone go and research it um, we, we the program just basically says these students all have passions and things that they're interested in and things that they love and things that they find amazing um, let them pick their own topics and so basically we um, go through sessions with the kids to help them understand what genius hour is and help them find a and develop a guiding question. It has to be something that they can't just Google and get in 15 minutes, something that's going to take them time to research and develop. And then work at the some a lot of them work in teams of three to four. And then um, they gather their data and put together a presentation. And then we have a Genius Hour Expo in the spring. And the cool part about it is then we have 350 kids that are all individual experts in their field. They're the smartest in our building on their topic. So we're pretty excited for um, Genius Hour to be kicking that off again. Um, and it's really fun because you tell kids, this is what we want to do. And they're like, well, what, what can I research on? Whatever you want. OK, but how do I present it? However you want. You figure it out. And to be honest with you, major, 90 percent of the time, they go way and above what we would have asked them to do. And so kids can do a lot of amazing things when you set them free in that way. Um, uh, to just today and then uh, tomorrow, we're going to be we're still d diving into our screening data on reading and math, um, taking a look at uh, how kids did at our mid-year. Um, our mid-year evaluations and then also what are the classroom teachers seeing um, and then we have students that started intervention groups at the beginning of the year some of them are going to be exiting and we have recommendations for parents some new um, kids that we think would could come in and get some extra help and in interventions in math and reading and we're in the middle of that process Josh mentioned parent teacher conferences on the 7th and the 10th and um, in addition to that, we'll hold some additional parent meetings on standard-based grading for parents that have questions. Um, it's probably going to be my, my 12th meeting now, so um, over the last four or five years. So if anyone that wants to come in, parents in the middle school, and be invited, and we'll get some information out on that. And then um, we have middle school solo and ensemble contest on February 10th, which happens to also be the night of parent-teacher conferences and in-service. So it's a little bit more difficult, but we don't set the date for the regional. So we're, um, we're going to have a very, very busy building. Any questions for me? Is that being held in Amory? I don't believe so, but I can't answer I that. 
Yeah, I think it's somewhere else. I yeah, it is not in Amory, okay. I, but I'm not sure where it's being held. Yeah. But uh, it's like a 10 year rotation, so yeah, it's not likely to be in Amory because it was in Amory a few years ago, right? Yeah, right, it's like every 10 years you get it. So I'm not sure, I, I don't have off the top of my head where they're going, but I can find that out. But I have it down on my calendar. No, oh, okay, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and unfortunately, I think that may hold out parents. Um, but in conferences, we're going to be sending out um, invites to families. I think we're all doing the similar fashion where parents sign up for their time slots that they so choose including the method if they want to come in in person or do it remotely in a different way um, to be honest with you I don't see us ever moving away from giving those parents that option having either you can come in and meet one-on-one -on -one or we'll you can call or we'll call you and we'll set that up has been um, a game changer and in it's increased percentages and I think meets the needs of a lot of different people so um, Parents will probably, if you know, they're having to go to um, the solo ensemble contest, obviously we'll try to sign up the, the first session. Yeah. That, yeah. So, all right, thanks. Well, it is great. It's much better than waiting in line outside of a teacher's yes, it is. <laughs> it is. <laughs> classroom that's, for that's true. however long. <laughs> all right, thank you. Yep. Thanks, Tom. I would echo Tom's thoughts. I know just last fall having parent teacher conferences our turnout rate is 99 percent and so if our goal is to connect with our families then we're doing a really good job of offering what works for them benchmark assessment so intermediate school was the first to go when we returned from christmas break so our assessment through fastbridge ran january 4th through january 10th um, it went really well it went really smooth so right now our grade level teams and our specialists are looking at all of the data to um, then create intervention groups so those are tier one tier two and tier three the great thing about FastBridge is it actually provides prescribed interventions um, which has been a, a huge asset so that's for both ELA and for math PBIS celebration on January 7th we welcomed over four high school students who read or who participated in a wonderful celebration um, those four high school students and then our fifth grade leadership team had to complete an obstacle course in here for all of our students and then the four high school students stayed and did a question and answer panel discussion on empathy and they answered questions about what is empathy who's modeled it for you and how has it been really important in your relationships and and our students were in awe of the high school students and to get a message across we will definitely utilize high school students again because it was very quiet in here CESA math standards rollout myself and three district math representatives went to Turtle Lake and attended a 2021 Wisconsin math standards rollout um, so we looked at the shifts we looked at um, how they would be changing and possibly affecting our math curriculums or our math rollouts our essential standards um, and then it allowed some time for some district action planning so we were able to kind of form an action plan these will be implemented in 2024 2025 so we do have some time there's two additional virtual sessions coming up in January there's a k-8 virtual session so we'll, myself and a team will attend that here at the intermediate school and then in February there is a high school session and we'll have a high school team um, and a middle school representative and then myself I'll also be there I'll say what Tom had said about Prairie Fire Theater that was wonderful um, another thing in addition to the two performances that were put on Friday night and Saturday and all the practices that were put in is Prairie Fire actually comes to the intermediate school and I believe the sixth grade as well and does acting sessions for our students so students that are interested were able to come into this space and receive a one-hour workshop session and it was it was wonderful the English language arts adoption process is ongoing Cheryl and I are working collaboratively with that um, in December before we went on Christmas break Cheryl and I met with a CESA 11 educational consultant that just helped us review what our plans were reevaluate our rubric I'm going to report to you out on HMH Cheryl and I both are tag teaming on on the two different curriculums really organizing what our teachers need getting them access so I'm working with HMH into reading our next steps with HMH are at our in-service teachers that teach reading will complete a two-hour training our intent with HMH is to pilot in February so it'll be a one-week pilot all teachers will be piloting the same module and after piloting we'll come back and we'll have a conversation on 
you know, how did it go? Did it meet our needs? Do we foresee it being something that we would want to adapt? Upcoming events, um, as no service or no school in service day on Monday, the IPO is hosting a winter ball on January 29th parent-teacher conferences. We have a new event that we are in the works of planning here at the Intermediate School on February 22nd. It's called Love Your Library event. So I'm working with our AR committee and Annie Brayton and Deb Anderson. It's gonna be an event here in the evening where we welcome families into our library to browse our books, um, complete a scavenger hunt, snuggle up and read some books with a loved one, a parent or guardian, and then also to have a treat. Our hope is to welcome families into our library, see the wonderful books we have and the great resources that we have here. Finally, February 24th, fourth graders will have an Iditarod presentation. So we're gonna have two guest speakers that will come in and talk to fourth grade. They've experienced or worked the Iditarod. So that's something exciting for them. Any questions? Tonight it was the Love Your Library event? Sure. 22 22. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's the, yes. It's, it's a Tuesday. It is. Lots of twos it's a, in there. It's a Tuesday, by the way. <laughs> <clears throat> um, at what time? Um, 6 o'clock to 7.15. Couldn't go at 2 o'clock. Yeah, we should. <laughs> Can we arrange that? <laughs> 22, maybe. Yeah. It's hilarious. It's hilarious. <laughs> we could serve tacos. <laughs> nice. Yeah, thank you. Oh, we're getting carried away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no way. We just feel, you know, we have so many great books in here. We just to be able to highlight authors and for families to come in and see the beautiful space that we have to read books. We're going to actually do some book talks. Mrs. Brayton, myself, a couple of other, other educators in this space are going to do some book talks. So talking about some favorite authors, um, some favorite books that we have, and then actually we're going to have grade levels vote on book recommendations and we'll share that out after that event. Fabulous. Yeah. Perfect. Um, and then what grade level teachers will be doing the um, pilot for the H HMH? All, all grade level teachers grade will. Okay. Yep. So I know at Cheryl's building, K through, so both of these curriculums don't have a pre-K component. Great. So it'd be K-5. K-5. Yes. Got it. Thanks. Thank you. I'll try really hard not to repeat too much of what has already been said. Um, I'd like to start out by talking about our reading program at the elementary school. It's called The Sky is the Limit. It kicked off on June 6th with a family event in the evening. And we had 185 children and adults that were registered for it. But if you think if you remember January 6th, it was very, very cold. And so we had about half of the people in attendance, but it was a fabulous evening. It started out where um, our children were grouped into um, cohorts. We tried to keep them in their grade level cohorts as much as possible. And they were exposed to a bingo game, which talked about the variety of genres in our reading in our library. And then at the end, they, so they played bingo. And then once they got a bingo, they transitioned into the cafeteria where Mrs. Shu, our reading specialist and our Title I teacher, did a remarkable job of gathering books from all over our community, including the library that was giving away books, families that were giving away books. So our entire cafeteria was filled with libraries library books of different genres and the families could go in and each student could take home 10 books Holy moly. yes mm -hmm. and they were free of charge to us but we were able to share them with our families and we believe it or not had enough books that our the next day the students could go in with their class mates or their um, their classroom and they were also invited to take home books so Kudos to Mrs. Shu and her. I'm going to say Mrs. Shu and her and Mrs. Shu and company who planned the event for our families. Um, the purpose behind the reading program again is to encourage families to read together. We want kids to read 15 at least 15 minutes each evening, or have family members read to them, or siblings um, read to them. I had the first this week where a little girl had a new baby brother and she told me that she read her new baby brother five books. So it was fabulous and she was even able to give me the, the titles of the books. So 
when the children read, they turn in a reading slip. The reading slip powers our airplane, and our airplane takes them throughout our country. So it's pretty exciting. Um, and it's a month-long process, a, a month-long um, reading program. We have, as Jessica said, we are tag teaming the work behind this pilot. And she's um, focused mainly on Houghton Mifflin. And I'm focused mainly on reading, American Reading Company, um, learning both. Both of us are learning together with our teachers. The American Reading Company, the focus is on the science of reading and the components, um, the explicit instruction. And that's, it's not anything new. It's you know been around for a long, long time. But the five reading components of the American Reading Company is really explicit instruction in phonological awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, and in the end, um, comprehension. So it's, um, as you know, a very big decision for our school, um, K through 5. This Thursday, I'm actually going to get something that Jessica didn't talk about, is the, and it's her thing. It's um, the curriculum coordinators meeting. But I'm going to join her in the afternoon because the whole focus is on the science of reading. So we just continue to learn about it. And we're really pushing out a lot of information to our staff because we want them to be in the know when making that big decision. Um, as Jessica said, on the in-service day, they're going to be exposed to Houghton Mifflin and the ARC um, portion of that day is going to be very explicit instruction for teachers at their grade level. So both we've had K through five presentations, we've had um, building presentations, and now we're really honing in on their grade level, which we're really excited about. And I think the teachers are excited as well. February 3rd, in family folders, we have program option forms going home. Program option forms provide families information about the variety of different amazing programs that we offer in our district, including Montessori, project-based learning, AIM, um, and then we call our traditional programs Legacy. So there will be information that will go home. Families can rate that their child. They can sign up for whatever program they want. Some of the programs fill up, so there's a, a lottery with them. If families are interested, we offer opportunities for them to come in and observe. But you have to call ahead of time. That information will be going home on February 3rd as well as to the process for that. But we really encourage families to come in and see what those programs look like. And um, kudos to the teachers for opening their classrooms so that families can do that. We um, have our own little um, mini, um, what did you call that, Tom? Your little, where did he go? His little focus, you know what you do, what you talked about. Genius hour, thank you. We have kind of a genius um, situation where children can uh, um, research in first grade and second grade. First grade focuses strictly on the ocean dive creatures and second grade is biographies and they both have um, evening presentations where they share the information that they gained. So that's something for our families to look forward to. And um, mark your calendars. March 4th is the elementary school calendar or carnival. It's called, the theme is Down on the Farm. And I really want to give a, um, a special thank you to Power Up, which is sponsored by Health Partners, because they provide the food for that event. And that has just been a, a, a wonderful thing for our school and district. And last but not least, we have our music concert starting at the elementary school. The kindergarten teachers, that's more in the spring. They have individual concerts. But first grade, second grade, and lower elementary have concerts that will take place in the auditorium. So families should keep their eyes open for those dates. Any questions? Do you need to bring a cow? You, d you know what? We've had cows. Are you, are you um, <laughs> suggesting that you'd like to? Are you volunteering? They've been in the lobby, little calves. 
Oh, yeah, the little calves. Yeah. Uh-huh. I might. We'll see what I've got. Okay, <laughs> okay. March 4th. We will know. love it. <laughs> I have one question. So you're doing this pilot program with the Houghton Mifflin. Are you also doing a pilot program yes. with the Science Freedom? Yes, we are piloting both Houghton Mifflin and ARC. Okay. We're trying to do the same and give each program the, the same attention. So is that later on then? Ours, the, the ARC one is January 31st. Oh. And what's different than in the past is in the past, the company sent us all the materials. Now it's a lot of downloading the materials, and um, which isn't as teacher friendly, but we're trying to make it as teacher friendly as possible. But yes, they will be piloting each for a week. Good question, thank you. Thank you. Good evening, just a few quick updates from People Services. Um, a name you've heard before, uh, we'll be collaborating, uh, continuing to collaborate with Chris Crow, who's a school-based mental health facilitator. And next steps are really to uh, look at, you know, if the district, we are certainly invested in trauma-sensitive practices in schools, uh, what are the next steps? Where are we going with um, our school-based mental health grant? Um, and, you know, how can we increase services to support students with their mental health and staff with their mental health, really anyone in the district. Um, so some of those ideas, you know, are, are going to be put together on a spreadsheet. That's going to be shared with as many of our at-risk data teams or special ed teams or general ed teams to really, what do you envision um, for some ways that we can better support whether it be students or staff, uh, particularly within schools. So that could be uh, direct counseling, it could be professional development, it could be a referral process for, for uh, student-based mental health. Um, so this is a really kind of exciting first step uh, to this and a really important one because this is where we gather ideas about um, what are gonna be the relevant ways that we can support kids and that staff are really gonna buy into um, to support kids. Uh, and uh, it's an important aspect as well because the school-based mental health grant um, is a wonderful resource, but it doesn't provide for direct mental health counseling or support. So if we're looking down the road at doing that in the future, it's something where we need to work with local agencies and providers and find some sort of sustainable um, funding stream um, complete with you know sliding scales, um, develop um, some sustainable resources is, that we can support kids with if we're going to look at direct counseling because that is a, a would be a, a new line in the budget, so to speak, or something that we would need to plan for with grant funding um, or, or another way. Um, so it's really exciting work, though, when you get an opportunity to really just reach out to staff with ideas uh, to support kids. Um, emotional behavioral disability criteria has changed officially. Um, those include um, demonstration of behavioral concerns in academic and non-academic school settings, um, the inclusion of a, a trusted adult staff member chosen by the student um, in the course of an evaluation process for emotional behavioral disability, um, and just to focus on, you're going to hear it again and again, evidence-based practices, and that comes up here again in the updated uh, emotional behavioral disability criteria. Um, myself and our school um, psychologists will be making the rounds at staff meetings to um, provide teachers and administrators the information they need to know that will affect them in terms of the change in this criteria. Um, dynamic learning map maps, we're getting towards forward testing, ACT. Um, this is just a, you know, a yearly assessment that we uh, do for just a small handful of kids with disabilities. Um, we've got a couple new teachers um, one new teacher at the high school who is uh, new to this assessment in the school district of Amory, so we're getting her through training, um, and just so you're aware of that. And then finally, um, other, uh, other trainings, of course, just want to mention the director of special ed trainings. They happen monthly. Those are important things um, that, that certainly I participate in and share relevant data with our school psychologists. It gives me an opportunity to network with other directors in the district since there's only one of me love to collaborate with all my administrators, but there's only one director of pupil services, so it's a helpful um, format for me to learn about things that are happening in other districts. And the federal, federal uh, conference, federal funding conference, is happening here um, in February 28th, and we work pretty closely 
um, with Mr. Deeb. I don't think either one of us are going to feel comfortable attending in person this year, but we'll be looking for the guidance it releases um, with the federal funding conference because there's always new updates in the in the grant world to to be concerned about. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Brax. Now we got a new one. John McBride <laughs> with our school nutrition report. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is John McBride. I'm the director of school nutrition for Amory. Uh, this is my fourth month uh, here, new to school nutrition. I come from restaurant worlds and culinary background. Um, so I'll try to keep this uh, brief and sweet. Um, so the first thing I just wanted to go over, obviously school year 21 or 2021, all of the key performance indicators of a school nutrition department can just be thrown right out the window with COVID closures, all that sort of stuff. So the important parts to kind of talk about really here are just our ADP or average daily participation uh, has increased throughout the district, uh, both breakfast and lunch. Um, but the bottom line is that our daily participation number is still relatively low at 68%, um, which is something that we're going to work on on bringing up. Um, as of last year, uh, the ladies in the department, they had served just shy of 320,000 total meals district-wide. So, you know, that's a, <laughs> it's a pretty sizable number for 181 student contact days a year. So it's, uh, it's, it's pretty, pretty impressive when you kind of break down the numbers. Um, moving on to the next portion is just kind of our free and reduced numbers for this year. Um, obviously, we use this as our benchmark uh, across the district. For our purposes during this time, because we are getting paid full reimbursement, it is universal school lunch. These numbers are not super important outside of the trend. Uh, and the trend that we're starting to see is a 2, or is a two to 6% increase at all the schools. Uh, and there's kind of been a 2, a, two to 4% increase in just this school year in our FNR numbers. Um, so our, our free and reduced is on its way up, and as you can see, we're at about 42% district-wide uh, as of the look-back period, which is in uh, September. Uh, October comes around, that's our deadline, so then we start to kind of trail off from there. Um, so grand totals from all programs for last year. Uh, again, I know Stacy Nelson over the past has presented on a lot more detailed numbers. The problem is, is there's half of them that are artificially high due to having two months without in-person learning. And then there are some numbers that are artificially low because of the same. Um, our fund balance did grow quite substantially in last year. Uh, you know, we started off at 242 uh, with revenues and expenditures were uh, started the year at about 412,000 uh, in the red. So the 100%, the, the reason behind this is that the USDA reimbursement rate during this period uh, is about twice what it was prior, plus we have every student in the district on this program. Uh, so the current reimbursement rates uh, actually just switched over on January 1. Uh, so each student for breakfast is $2.60 and lunch is $4.56. So it is quite a bit more substantial than in previous uh, school years. So that trend will continue through this school year and hopefully onwards from there. Um, currently this year we have some interesting challenges that change daily. Uh, currently the big one is just supply chain. Uh, limited deliveries of bulk products to manufacturers have really bogged down the entire industry. Um, delivery and routing issues with all of the vendors continue on a daily basis. Uh, today, for instance, CESA 11 wide, it was 1,700 cartons of milk that just didn't get delivered this morning. Um, and that's kind of a daily thing. Uh, what we're starting to see now is decades old product lines from reputable manufacturers are either being reduced or the manufacturers are saying, we're done. We're not taking in any more product from USDA. We're not selling it to schools because the retail market is so much better. Uh, and then ultimately, it just leads to decreased availability in the historically well-received products from all school. Uh, the products most of us had, regardless of when you were here, like Italian dunkers and dippers and that sort of thing. 
Labor continues to be a little bit of a challenge. Um, I think everybody is experiencing it uh, with substitution shortages. Um, I do have to say that the three substitutes that we do have in our department, I have folk have basically become, you know, full-time fixtures, and it's been amazing seeing them do it. Uh, and then we're obviously dealing with some constant outs from illness as well. Um, and then we'll talk about aging equipment here in, in another slide. The big ones right now, milk cartons. Uh, milk cartons is the current struggle. Uh, there is, believe it or not, only three manufacturers of milk cartons in the United States, uh, and none of them are able to produce enough to keep up with demand. Uh, so at some point, we're either going to be bulk, bulk pouring milk, uh, or there is a DPI waiver to not serve fluid milk whatsoever for a certain period of time. I know. <laughs> <laughs> the dairy yeah. farmer over is like, oh, no. yeah, yeah. There's no shortage of milk. There's shortage of vessels. They're um, gonna make more cheese. <laughs> yes, and and I don't know how much you guys. I don't know how much everybody knows about direct diversion programming through the U.S. Department of Agriculture, but essentially. We get bulk raw materials delivered to manufacturers to reduce our cost of the end cell product. Uh, and a lot of those companies are starting to drop out. Um, so that last year we had, I think there was 14 in this year, or it's already down to 11, likely to drop below 10. Uh, and then as similarly, the CISA, uh, CISA, as a CISA 11 update, uh, the purchasing manager decided to focus on family. So there is currently no CISA 11 contract and purchasing manager. Uh, so myself and Bobby from uh, New Richmond have stepped into that role. Uh, so hopefully if, uh, if all goes well, Kemp's will try to keep us happy since I hold that contract over the next person. Uh, moving on to some department changes since I've been here. Uh, the biggest ones, uh, increased all cart offerings at high school. Uh, we do fluctuate this up and down in communication with some of the, the uh, teachers and administrators uh, based off of um, if kids are uh, earning it or not in, in essence, uh, and ultimately just availability of products. Um, we did return the salad bar, which was a controversial choice at the time, but now every school in CESA 11 is doing it. Uh, we returned that at the high school and the middle school. Uh, we started reducing waste by limiting choices in the schools where choices only take up time, such as elementary and intermediate school. Uh, I think about half the teachers at both schools uh, were question mark about it, and now that it's taken time, now everybody is happy with it. Um, we introduced additional scratch cooked items uh, to our menus, uh, and we changed our focus on just feeding students to feeding students what they need to thrive, not just survive, which is ultimately my, my goal. Uh, we've rewrote menus to include offerings as students enjoy with pairings that make sense, uh, such as uh, serving um, a chicken patty sandwich with potato fries instead of sand selling a chicken patty sandwich with baked beans and broccoli. Uh, it makes, if it makes more sense to your students, it makes more sense to everybody. Um, we're continually searching for additional permanent and substitute staff. Um, we are trying to return to the idea of wholesome, well-sourced ingredients, although that is incredibly hard right now. Uh, <clears throat> and my staff has started go undergoing training uh, on how to cook from scratch again. Um, next slide is just the PLE tool, or the uh, paid lunch equity tool, which is used to uh, measure uh, what we need to charge for paid lunch. It's not something obviously we're used, uh, that we're using this year, um, but as you can tell by the uh, chart there, it is obviously, uh, we are way above the line for what we need, meaning when paid lunch returns, if it does, <coughs> we can set our price. Uh, unfortunately, next year we don't know uh, what will be happening. Uh, there is some legislature through the state and through the federal government that is trying to make its way through for universal free lunch, which I believe is the goal of every school nutritionist since U.S. You know, introduced the child nutrition program. Uh, if that happens, that's great. Uh, if it doesn't, uh, my guess is, is next year will be a higher reimbursement rate, but just on the free and reduced side versus universal free lunch is kind of what we're hearing right now. 
So the next big thing is equipment needs, and I know you know the two main topics right now are referendum and COVID uh, through everybody's minds. Um, this is kind of separate, um, just based off of some equipment needs that we have <clears throat> that'll help utilize some of that additional overage that we have currently in Fund 50. Uh, steam kettles at the elementary school uh, were last replaced before 1990. Uh, the vent and hood system believe it or not, is original to the building. Um, the intermediate school is, we do have equipment that's starting to drop off on that list as well. Uh, I know it's only 20 years old, but that's a long time for an oven to run five days a week. <clears throat> if you look uh, on the far right picture, that's actually the two new ovens that uh, Stacy had talked to you guys about last year. Uh, unknown to everybody at the time is as soon as you introduce those ovens, then the hood fell out of compliance. So whenever uh, Amy Corbett opens up one of those ovens, the entire elementary school cafeteria floods with steam. I think you've probably noticed that, Cheryl, sometimes uh, it's something to be seen. So that's something that George Sigsworth and myself are starting to work on. At the high school, <clears throat> this is where we have the most uh, equipment that is starting to drop on a daily basis. Uh, we actually have two different convection ovens um, that are uh, plus or minus 20 years old. Um, they have very limited to no additional working tables or workspace um, to, in order to do a lot of uh, the things that I'm asking those kitchens to do. Um, we have a steam kettle that was last replaced pre-1990, uh, and then we also have a steamer that is going bad there. So our equipment needs are much more advanced at the high school than the other schools, but there are some that are needed through the others. <coughs> this slide just kind of shows the, the thing there. The steam kettle on the far right is actually two components that eats up a, a lot of square footage in a very small kitchen, if you've ever seen it. So then uh, the last couple slides here, I just wanted to address some kind of future plans of myself and where uh, we would like to kind of start taking um, the school nutrition of Amory. Um, it is a very robust community here filled with a lot of wonderful home growers, a lot of dairy farmers, we've got ranchers, we've got cattlemen, we've got a wealth of resources here that are somewhat untapped. <clears throat> However, since 2008, uh, scratch cooking has come out of the kitchen in schools. R equipment was replaced with equipment to reheat versus cook. Um, labor was slashed because it was went from ready to, it, basically the focus is now on ready to eat foods. You pull it out of the freezer and if your kid needs to suck on it like a lollipop, they still get the same nutrition quality. So. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, the, that's kind of the, the, where a lot of schools are. So the goal in the next 12 months is really to return to about 25% total scratch cooking. Um, <coughs> excuse me. To start purchasing about 15% from local sources based off of proteins and produce, which of course is incredibly seasonable up here. Um, increase our participation across all districts to 70%. Uh, I will be applying for a large farm to school grant in collaboration with Derek Meyer uh, to establish a one acre uh, school garden, hopefully, um, that will uh, yield us plenty of produce for at least the several months where we can do that. So the 24 month goal is just basically increasing all those numbers again, getting to 35% scratch cooking, 25% local purchasing, increase our participation to 73% and utilize five to six different product types that are actually from the district garden. Three years, if we look out three years, the hope is to be at 50% scratch cooking, 30% local purchasing, increase our participation to 76% and utilize 10 to 14 different produce types from District Garden, which would allow us then to completely leave the USDA direct diversion program and no longer serve any sort of ready to eat pre-processed foods. I know that sounds a little bit scary, um, but there are several districts throughout the US that have successfully done that uh, and have seen their participation, have seen their uh, health, student health, all that sort of thing start to really increase. <coughs> Excuse me. And then finally, I just wanted to recognize 
um, all of the team leads that we have that do such a wonderful job, our permanent staff, substitute staff, uh, Twyla Sicknick and Becky Schmidt for continually helping us to um, uh, find new good people, and Michelle Moore, the school secretary, uh, who is the one who trained me in. <laughs> so if you guys have any questions, feel free. Um, <clears throat> moving out of processed foods and the typical warm up, how would then the equipment needs that you're looking at then um, fit if we're replacing those, then how would that fit with the plan of moving out of that realm and into the scratch cooking? Yeah, so it's, it's a great question. Actually, if we go back a couple slides to either of the equipment ones. So on the far right picture there, that's what's known as a steam jacket kettle or a steam kettle. <clears throat> those are deep. That one in particular is 60 gallons. That's mostly used uh, in school nutrition for things like pasta, soups, sauces. Um, but the majority of those products now come in boil and bag uh, uh, packaging. So they fill those up with water, bring them to a boil, hang whatever in there. It gets cut open, put on the line, and is served to our students from there. So <clears throat> being that that is there, the replacement would not be replacing a steam kettle with a steam kettle. It would be replacing a steam kettle with what's known as a tilt skillet, uh, which is a square version, um, but it is a 30, 30 to 40 gallon capacity. Uh, but that particular piece of equipment kind of has dual action. You can use it for making soups, sauces, anything, uh, or you can completely clean it out. You can uh, season the uh, two inch thick steel plate, and you can use it as a flat top for making sandwiches, grilling chicken, grilling, I mean, basically it's just a flat top grill at that point. Um, so when we're starting to talk about utilizing equipment better, we wouldn't be adding things like open face broilers or any grease laden type foods, deep fryers, that sort of thing. It's more using equipment and technology to our advantage to get more bang for our buck. Uh, and each one of those steam kettles, believe it or not, is about 35 grand. They're not cheap. Uh, versus a tilt skillet, which is a multi-tool, is about 20 to 22. So you could use then the new piece of equipment to make soups and stews, whatever, from yep. scratch. Yep. Instead of having them boiled in Correct. bag plastic. That Correct. That we're literally cooking them in the plastic, right? Correct. Here? Yep. Shoot. Okay. So then <laughs> how is that being received in amongst the staff members that you have of scratch cooking versus I mean, we only have so much time to get meals out to kids so how is that a factor is it a factor or so it's it it, it really it's not uh it's not a, a large factor uh, there is a large percentage of my staff uh that worked here the last time scratch cooking was here. Um, you know, we're, people remember a time, and Cheryl might remember, you know, the, the cooks in the kitchen at the elementary used to bake for the entire district every day. And that was not that long ago. We've got uh, a lot of this stuff really started changing with the Smart Snacks initiative in 2007, 2008, and is kind of just steamrolled from there. Um, so it wasn't that long ago where we had all the equipment necessary to make you name it, uh, that's not deep fat fried in house. Um, so a lot of those uh, staff members remember those days and they want to go back to those days uh, because it's more the scratch cooking that we're talking about is not making sous vide duck breast for, for 4K <laughs> students. It's making, I mean, we could, uh, it's making uh, spaghetti sauce that's based off of diced tomatoes and fresh tomatoes instead of buying it in a pouch. And that's really, you know, those pouches are where little pallets do not like. They just don't. So I think participation would increase based off of it's more, um, just more flavorful. It's just better, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, in the One Acre Garden, I'm sure this will be, uh, we'll probably see this again um, several times before this, this actually happens. Yep. <laughs> um, just wondering, obviously, we look at harvesting from garden one acre is a lot. Yep. That's a lot. Yep. Um, and we look at harvest time, that's always in um, 
August usually. I mean, yep. year, year, I mean, through the growing season, depending on what you're growing. Um, but obviously not when school's in session other than summer school. Correct. So are we planning on um, preserving that? those items then is like canning tomatoes and doing those kind of things yeah so in in and that's kind of where the collaboration with Derek Meyer comes in uh, is because he wants to put this as part of his FFA Academy um, and then uh, also similarly Emily Larson with the FCS leadership Academy it'd be kind of working as kind of a group for coverage of planting maintaining that sort of thing um, but then ultimately like you said for whatever crops that we grow we would want something that we can a utilize in the moment and b that we can package and process for later consumption um, so the the example here would be doing carrots over squash simply because a frozen squash breaks down over time in the freezer versus a carrot stays the exact same molecularly so that's what we would kind of do. And that process is just kind of started. I know we have a small currently school garden uh, at the elementary school that's kind of somewhat been utilized over the years. Um, and the FFA students have produced microgreens several times throughout the years as well. Um, but microgreens are a novel thought, they're wonderful, but that doesn't do much for filling bellies um, more than it does just adding a little flair and flavor. Um, so. All right. All right. Well, I um, have a senior in high school this year, and she says that um, in amongst this recognition that you should also, um, that she sees you there oh. quite often filling in. So clearly yep. we're so shorthanded with our subs that you're filling in as well. Yes. So thank you to you for doing that. And she says you're killing the school lunch game. So <laughs> she's a girl like Steve. Probably Good. sits after her mom, but Good. she says you're killing it. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Guys. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> Next, uh, we'll have the library media presentation. Um, good evening, and thank you for having us here. I'm Annie Brayton, and I'm the Library Media Specialist for Lean Elementary and Amory Intermediate. <clears throat> uh, and I'm Greta McCarty. I'm the Media Specialist for the Middle School and High School. Um, and we'd just like to thank you again for having us here tonight to provide some more information about our media centers. Uh, over the past several years, we have been implementing a library plan that is aligned with the Future Ready Librarians Framework. As a future ready library, we focus on all of these wedges to help align our library program with the mission of the school district and to help prepare our students to be future ready. At the core, the future ready framework is centered around empowering learners with diverse skills and literacies, collaborating with peers and leaders to promote innovative practices, and ensuring equitable learning opportunities for all students. Today we want to talk about the center of our framework, which is, as you can see, uh, is all about literacy and the learner, and is where we spend most of our time. One of the biggest ways we support the literacy of our learners is through the library collection. So we thought it would be helpful to share how we build those collections to meet the needs of our students. So there's a lot of work that is involved with building our library collections, and a lot of factors um, are consulted when making purchases. When developing our collections, the following policies and guiding principles are at the core of our decisions. The Amory School Libraries are to provide a wide range of materials at varying levels of difficulty with diversity of appeal and which represent different points of view. In order to meet the needs of students and teachers, it is our professional responsibility to provide an up-to-date collection, provide materials on various sides of topics, to provide representative materials of both our local community and our global community, or to provide a comprehensive collection appropriate to the school community as well. The core of our profession is centered on literacy, and one of the best ways we can support that goal is to promote a love of reading in our students. Selecting books that spark imagination, fulfill a need for information, provide stories in which students see their own realities, 
stories where they can learn about someone else's experience and learn about the world around them is how we help promote a love of reading and is a bit of an art form. All of these different types of stories are what spark a student's love of reading at different stages in their own lives. And while the process to select those books is a bit of an art form, we also apply a form of science to help guide our selection process by using district policies, guiding principles, and professional reviews to make sure we are selecting books that meet the needs of all learners while maintaining an age-appropriate collection. When selecting books for our libraries, we use the following resources to guide our decisions. We use professional reviews, such as the School Library Journal, Common Sense Media, Book List, WIMTA, the Junior Library Guild, Follett, Teaching Books, and many others. We also use award-winning and recommended lists for our school librarians and, um, from the American Library Association and the Young Adult Library Services Association. We use the recommended age range by these professional sources to determine if the book fits within our collection guidelines for each library. In fact, when we came into our roles as media specialists a few years ago, we added additional guidelines stating there must be multiple reviews indicating the books fit within the grade levels of each library. After receiving the books, it's still not uncommon for us to reevaluate the books and shift them to different collections. This is an ongoing process, and we are continually discussing where books may fit best within our libraries. Students have access to books through looking in the physical libraries, uh, collections in our buildings, and through Destiny Discover, which is our online catalog for books. The database includes titles of both physical books and ebooks. Students in grades 3 through 12 are taught and encouraged to use the catalog. The physical books in each library are selected based upon the age range, varied interests, and curricular content of each school. Sora is our online catalog for ebooks. It is a subscription service governed by the Wisconsin DPI, CESA, and Wisconsin Library Services. This collection is selected by Overdrive, li Overdrive librarians who specialize in developing K-12 library collections. The Wisconsin School Dig Digital Literacy Consortium Board and Selection Advisory Committee set the direction for this collection. At this time, Local librarians are not able to remove ebooks that were added by the consortium. This service allows the district to have access to over 40,000 books, ebooks, and audiobooks for about $1,200 per year. Students in grades 3 through 12 are taught how to find and check out ebooks using the Sora app or by searching in Destiny Discover. The collection is divided into three age, age categories, pre-K through 5, 6 through 8, and 9 through 12th grade. When searching for books in the SOAR app, students will only see titles in their age collection or lower. Uh, however, because Destiny Discover is a different catalog system than SORA, it doesn't recognize the three age level collections. That means if a student searches for a specific title in Destiny Discover, they will be able to see the title even if it's in a collection above their age range. However, once a student logs into Sora to check out the book, they will be given a message that says, this title is not available for your age level. So just like our physical collections have some safety measures in place for students having access to titles appropriate to their age level, Sora also has some built-in collection into their collection as well. The library also recognizes the importance of maintaining a collection of current, appropriate, and useful materials. And as trends in literacy, student population, and curriculum change, and as best practices and selection guidelines are updated, it's important for us to reevaluate books in the collection. Therefore, periodic evaluations of the collection are performed in order to remove or replace materials that are no longer useful or no longer appropriate. While the weeding process goes through an extensive and thoughtful, thoughtful process by utilizing many different reports, 
collection analysis, and review sources, many books are weeded based upon their date of publication, their circulation statistics, and appearance. For example, we typically revalue books that are worn out, dirty, have missing pages, outdated or inaccurate information, fall outside of the age demographics of our students, or have had a low circulation over the past five years. This is a continual process in the library and one which is never complete. The ability for us to maintain an updated and robust collection to meet the needs of our students and staff is in large part because of the Common School Fund, which is our state-funded library budget. The Common School Fund is a constitutionally created trust fund created for public school libraries in the state of Wisconsin. When Wisconsin became a state, the federal government granted Wisconsin 1.5 million acres of land. Wisconsin's early leaders dedicated these lands for public education to support and maintain public K-12 libraries. <coughs> when these lands were sold, the proceeds were deposited in the Common School Trust Fund. The net annual earnings of the Common School Fund are distributed to each Wisconsin public school district to purchase library materials such as books, instructional materials, online databases, and technology. This fund helps reduce local property taxes because the school district does not look to local taxpayers to fund these purchases. We are really fortunate that Wisconsin's early leaders prioritized the need to provide equitable services and resources to all staff and students, no matter what district they're in. Wisconsin is the only state with a common school fund. Collection development and liter literacy is an important part of our job. And the information covered today just scratches the surface of the process involved in developing our collections. But we hope it gives you a little understanding of the practices that we follow. As librarians, we love it when people ask us questions. We are more than happy to talk to anyone who has questions about the policies and the guidelines we follow or about specific books that we have in our library. Please feel free to reach out to us if you have any further questions. And we would also like to thank you for having us here tonight. And we welcome another opportunity to come back and share more information about our roles <coughs> and the different programs that we have going on in our libraries. Do you have any questions for us? really excited to um, see the February 22nd Tuesday event for the Lovely Your Libraries. I think that'll um, really open the doors to give people time to come in and ask questions and for you all to be available and see what's in our libraries and um, just have that really good, open, um, honest communication that with the community and the school. I think that's a, just a really great event that you guys are putting on. And um, uh, I appreciated that you spent some time talking about the, the Common School Fund um, that you know we were uh, gifted the for thought of people putting a real stock in our reading education mm -hmm. for our kids. So it's, it's pretty cool that they were the only state to yeah, have that. Yeah, it's something that a lot of people don't know, and it's an incredible gift that we have here. So. Mm. Very cool. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Next, we will talk about legal expenses. Okay, you asked me to bring a breakdown of legal <coughs> expenses. The item that you see before you, and then there's an itemized list that's been provided to you in your red folder, gives uh, four columns, month and year, then your total expense for legal expenses. That vendor is Weld Riley, who has been our vendor for the longest time, then expenses specific for open records requests, and then lastly, a column specifically for book challenge expenses. And then at the bottom, you see a grand total the way this works is you get billed typically on the 24th of each month, and then the item you see here is paid in the following month. So November 24th is paid in December, et cetera, et cetera. So if there are questions about what you see here, I will do my best to help. Well, we have an often a wide range of needs for the legal counsel questions. Sure, anything that's not under the second or the third and the fourth columns, you can assume is an other expense that's uh, attorney's fee for whatever that might be. For instance, when we purchased land, 
we hadn't done that in this district for 50 plus years yep. we need someone to draw up that documentation to make that happen so that would be another expense that's not in those two columns that you see there so there are other things yes mm -hmm. um i think you know we've had open records requests um since i've been on the board for multiple things um i just we typically incur those expenses due to um, ongoing litigation or, or personnel action items. Um, we expected to see those expenses kind of dropping off and obviously we're seeing this uptick here with um, the open records request expenses and uh, asked for this in um, the interest of the community knowing um, exactly what that money is being spent on, uh, been requested that, that there's uh, open and transparent communication for that um, and so we've incurred these expenses and has any of those expenses been passed along to anybody else at this time well let me respond to your your couple of remarks there when I first arrived in this capacity in the uh, month of November December of 2018 there were certainly legal expenses surrounding the departing district administrator and there were two lawsuits that were pending. That took all of 2019 on into early 2020. During that time frame, there were open records requests for information up to and including from the Amory Free Press. Then it was pretty dormant for most of 2020 and into 2021. And since April of 2021, there have been 17 open records requests reflecting the sums of money that you see here. The money that you see here spent, the total of $3,057.50 for open records requests and $45 for book challenge expenses. None of that money is has been recouped by the district. That's an expense of the district and then thereby, thereby inherently an expense to the taxpayer. So it's $3,057.50. We satisfy that request, but there's no money that's been received to offset that expense. No. Okay. Um, and any appeal to the uh, book challenge decisions that were made that would uh, possibly incur any further legal expenses? My hunch is that? in the month of January, because most of those, ch all of those challenges were lodged in December, and that was work that was done in December, billed at the end of December and then received here in the month of January. Simply haven't received that yet. So when we do, that amount would be known. Anything else? Okay, good information. Next we will talk about the school board election. Okay, the school board election is April 5th, 2022. Uh, by law, you need to do what's referred to as a draw. So we had some five or so individuals with witnesses and so forth uh, do a draw. The candidates in ballot order, meaning the order they'll appear on the ballot, have been listed there for you on the screen and on the sheet in front of you. So that's the way they would appear on the ballot in April. Pretty simple and straightforward. Okay. That takes care of our informational items. Uh, next, we'll go to the action items. The first action item are resolutions for referendum. By law, they need to be uh, stated here, as in their titles, not stated in full. You have those here with you in your packets. The first of the three items that you need to make a motion to approve, if you so choose, are first. The initial resolution authorizing general obligation bonds in an amount not to exceed $35 million. Item two, or resolution two, initial resolution authorizing general obligation bonds in an amount not to exceed 8.5 or 8,500,000. And then lastly, resolution providing for a referendum election on the questions, on the questions of the approval of the two initial resolutions authorizing issuance of general obligation bonds in an aggregate amount not to exceed $43,500,000. So if you would wish to proceed forward, you would need to make a motion to do so. Now it wouldn't, 
occur on the on a ballot this way, right? Or on a on a the the uh, in your packet in the back. You should have a actual ballot question. There's a lot of paperwork there, so let me fish it out myself. Second to last page. It's on. So, of course, second to last page. Page eight and nine. But they're just re it, just in two separate. So how would that how would that look? That would they need to vote on? There are two different questions. You would need to vote for each question. Right. <coughs> and those questions are on page seven and eight. Yeah, seven and eight. Yep. Mm. This has been run through Greg's law firm, which is who Baird Financial works with. They write referendum questions for a living. This is not a legal expense to us. This is not work that we do. We don't have that resource in our office, but Greg's law firm, there have been at least 10 iterations of this, if not more. So it's been seen and then some. And this, um, these resolutions as written will be presented uh, at community meetings to be further kind of explained what people are voting either yeah. for or against. Correct? Yes, the the battery of meetings has only just begun, so to speak. <laughs> None of that could have occurred until tonight occurs. Then after that, it's presenting that information at things such as community club, Lions Club, township meetings, meetings, other meetings within municipalities. We'll have information meetings here at school. Uh, there will be lots of information that folks will have up to and including an explanation what it is they're voting for because the ballot itself when you go to the ballot it, it can certainly look to be overly verbose right. because there is a lot of stuff there that's happening the presentations would lay that out uh, i've done one such presentation already to the high school staff last week um i believe well received and uh pretty clear so that has only just begun <clears throat> it's a lot of paperwork, a lot of protocols to fill there, in and do. And there's in more order to follow. To resolution. I guess there were, we've talked about it a lot. And I guess the, the choice is for us to go for one, go for the both, however you would like to try. Through our assessment with uh, Lisa Voison from Baird, we're in a good position, and we have good support. Uh, if we're going to do this, our debt load basically fell off, and so now is the time to, to do this. I was approached uh, by a constituent about, you know, trying to uh, do it within our budget, and and I said, well. Let's go, let's go to the high school wall flashing. And that's $4 million. How do you budget for that and to get the project done? You know, if we took the 700000 it would take us four or six years to finally get that money together in order to do that one project. The, the deferred money that we spend, the seven hundred, dollars it, it goes fast. To use the $700,000 to address $35 million of maintenance needs in the district takes you 50 years. Yeah. And if you're going to be here in 50 years, congratulations. But I don't think most of us are going to be in this line of work in 50 years. And 50 years of nothing else going wrong. Correct. Or nothing else <laughs> right. being fixed. <laughs> Which is not likely to occur. Yeah. So you can't do things of this sort through the budget, if you will. Yeah. I think it's always a concern when you sit in this position to um, ask these uh, resolutions for these referendums. Um, but that's where we're very fortunate that we get to put it on a ballot and let people decide for that. And I think um, in the spirit of that, it would be uh, not prudent for us to at least move forward to give the taxpayers a voice to say what they, what they feel on this. I thought that the community surveys showed some very good support for um, at least the 37 and a half million. I've, I feel very 
good about the eight and a half that we've looked at in order to get a lot more done um, with just a little bit more money than we were looking at for just $7 million for a daycare. So um, in that spirit of myself and, and seeing that this is going to go to the taxpayers in April, then I would move to approve the resolutions for referendum as presented. I'll second that. Is there any more further discussion? I think we've said a lot. We, we have to plan on the community support and uh, we'll go ahead with this. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. We're going to the resolution for a referendum. That was quicker than I thought. <laughs> I think well, we've talked about it. We've, 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 Next will be school calendar. Okay, the 2022-2023 calendar. It's gone through a couple of versions. We have a calendar committee and staff is, have also chimed in. Some of the highlights I'll walk through with you month by month, beginning with the month of August. We've got three days of in-service, the triangles, 23, 24, 25, very similar to years past. August 31st, uh, we are looking at doing a day on August 31st again with students present. It is an optional day of attendance. Uh, we are looking at a name change so people better understand it. Orientation day for some was confusing. So we look at that and uh, a name change for that day. September 1st is your legal first start day of school. Then you can require attendance. You got Labor Day right after that in-service day out towards the end of the month. The first week of October are your parent-teacher conferences and in-service days. Mirrors what we presently are doing and we are about to do here in February. Then we have uh, end of term and then an in-service day on the 7th. We have off three days for Thanksgiving. We did survey staff. There was mixed reviews in regards to three days off, two days off, no days off. <laughs> Um, if we have school, we're going to miss kids. There are folks that are in the woods and traveling to be with family. We get it. So it's what we have done in years past presently. Uh, then we have Christmas break, a change on Christmas break. Break. We have put a circle around December 23rd. We hadn't done that in years past for family to travel. So we've got those days off there the week of the 26th and the 23rd. We come back to school, end of semester, sort of paralleling where we are right now, uh, is the 20th. We have an in-service parent-teacher conference during February. Uh, we don't have a full-fledged spring break like we have this year, uh, though we do have an opportunity for folks to get away if they so choose. That 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th um, is sort of half of a spring break. Uh, April 7th is Good Friday. We have to have that off. And then we put a day on as the 10th. Folks can choose to get away there if they want to. Memorial Day at the end of May. And then the last day of school is June 1st. So right. we have um, a proposal of a calendar here for you. If you're as feedback you might have, I'm all yours. And the committee's good with this? Uh, well, there's Pretty no much. way you could uh, gather a committee of folks and say 100%, absolutely, we agree on every item. But we've looked at it and looked at it and looked at it for the better part of two months. Um, I, th I think we've gotten some good feedback, and I think we're this, this would be a proposal I would recommend that you approve. But no, 100% <coughs> on every item, no. That okay. doesn't exist. But the majority? Majority, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, what is the... Do we have issues about just days off or do we have issues about teacher contracted days or nope the number of days required isn't really days but rather instructional minutes mm -hmm. and this calendar satisfies that requirement of instructional minutes middle and high school is 1137 hours of instruction middle school and high school make it with three days built in as in three days for snow days or weather days if the middle school and high school make it 
the elementary and intermediate make it because they have less required. So yes, we meet our requirement. We've been as high as 189.5. We've been as low as 184.5. This comes in at 185.5. So you would need to make a motion to approve the calendar if you want to do that. Which day is a half day of, of teacher in service? And the last day of school. Oh. But we have been very flexible. Building administrators have allowed them to do that that night. In this case, that Friday or the Monday after. I mean, not everyone is ready to hit the books and get her done that day. Some do it the next in the morning. Got it. Well, I would make a motion that we approve the 2022-2023 school calendar. Second. Aaron seconds. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Aye. All right. We've got it. Next, we talk about the open enrollment space limitations. Brad. <coughs> All right, a yearly agenda item here. So um, we're charged uh, through a state statute at determining uh, open enrollment seats available or, or essentially not available um, for students who would open enroll here into the school district. Um, as in the past, kind of reviewed numbers, um, really the only recommendation that you see here is listed for our early childhood special ed uh, program that's preschool uh, to kindergarten at this time. Um, there are openings. If a student were to open enroll and be accepted tomorrow, we would have uh, a space available for them. Um, there are available slots of about 15. Um, eight are currently filled. Um, so this um, recommendation puts uh, a cap um, of that number 15 for next year. So essentially we have 15 seats open for early childhood education. About half of them are filled. Um, I don't have a crystal ball really. This is just, you know, numbers um, uh, ebb and flow. And uh, so we do our best uh, in making a, a, you know, a calculated guesstimate in terms of um, what the capacity of our program is. And really the focus in, uh, has been early childhood historically it's because we only have one teacher. Um, and so once that caseload gets to a, to a certain amount of size, it's difficult to go in mid-year and you know, hire another, especially a, a teacher who's um, specialized in terms of early childhood. Um, so that, that's kind of the barrier there. So this simply says that we would uh, cap our open enrollment, any open enrollment that would you know, push us above that 15 and we would say, I'm sorry, there's no space available here in the district to serve you, and it could certainly apply again in the future. Um, if numbers would change, we would, we would open it up again. Any questions on space yeah. availability? Um, I think we do this every year with a yeah. cap on it. Have we ever turned anybody away <coughs> for special needs that we've been so if we, if, if we don't have the staff to satisfy the need that's articulated in the IEP, yes, and others have turned our kids away too. I mean, there are only so mu there's only so much we can do right. with one staff person in a room. Yeah. So, yes, not often, but yes. Okay. Do we have a motion? I'll make a motion that we approve. Aaron, Any recommendation? Second. second. Chelsea, all in favor, say aye. 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 There we go. Thank you. Thanks, Brad. Thank you. Uh, next, we have the uh, public participation at board meetings policy okay. that we've tweaked. Policy 186, you asked for us to make a change uh, in regards to what constitutes political speech. You'll notice there, there is blue. The change, the addition is in green. So it's near the end. And that sentence reads, political speeches which are not materially related to the board decisions policies adopted by the board or are not about board meeting agenda items are strictly forbidden. So that was the only change added to the policy that you saw last month. Yep. Oh, sorry. On the next page, the rule that goes with it, the yeah. exact same thing was changed. 
not to read it to you again, it's the exact same. It's item number four on 186 exhibit. We have a motion for that policy 186. I guess I just, um, I have a comment first before we okay. uh, move forward with that, that um, again, this, this public participation at board meetings, this policy revision in no way um, prohibits people from coming and right. talking and still having um, say and input in what happens in the district in a specific manner. Um, that, that, that we're just in the interest of saving time and being specific to what's happening in our own district. Um, I think it was a, a good reason to kind of just shore this up, um, especially in where we see so many districts now moving away from just taking public comment off of the agenda. Um, I don't think that anybody is interested in moving in that direction. So um, I think this will really help us just kind of hone in on, on what we're doing here and there's that's in no way regarding anything that's been said that i don't feel that any public comment has been terribly out of line or unfocused to to degree of of having to shut anybody down ever so um i think i just want to i want to clarify that before we decide to go ahead yep. and pass this or um vote on this uh policy revision I think it's always been a priority of the board and administration to always look for exchange with community members. I mean, if you look on our website, my phone number is on there. All of us are on there, you know, so you have to talk to us. I'm not clairvoyant. None of us are. So, you know, when you have questions and things like that, please call. That's the, that's the key. Yeah, I think we appreciate having people come and speak at our board meetings and um, to understand that, you know, our dialogue doesn't usually happen. This is our meeting and that we take care of business, but we do appreciate to hear opinions and that's how this process, this process works. We represent those people and if you have suggestions of um, items that we have on the agenda, especially that evening or moving forward um, that you'd like to see heard, that's especially doing a second reading like this um, to have a, a specific suggestion brought in that's our job is to bring that at this time to the to our colleagues here and to discuss those things and to tweak these policies as necessary so like it's um we'll just shore things up and just wanted to make sure that nobody feels like they can't come and talk right. at these meetings so right absolutely with that uh, motion for the policy or I'll move to approve the public participation at board meetings policy. Second. And Dale. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Okay. <coughs> Getting down the list, aren't we? It's a long list tonight. Mm -hmm. It is. It is. <laughs> Next, uh, change or review our COVID. Okay, the first slide shows you your numbers of COVID cases in district from January 1st through the 7th. Again, bl blue is staff and red is students. So we had a total of 16 cases in that first week. That was on the heels of Christmas break where we really didn't have a lot of contact with folks. Last week, the number was significantly higher. That's the 8th to the 14th. There were 33 cases, 27 students six staff you'll see a breakdown of the staff cases from september 1st through january 16th listed there on the next slide um if i could make a word of mention about today in that we have real numbers from today we had 10 cases in district and I uh, got a special message from the county that the county will only be at this point testing and vaccinating. They won't be doing any other duties besides those two that came from Polk County Health mid-afternoon today. And what precipitated that is they had 512 cases over the weekend in the county from Saturday, Sunday through Monday. Our high mark for cases in the district 
when we went closed back last November was 848 cases in two weeks. We had 512 in three days. Not in the district, in the county. In the county. county. 512 in the county, 10 in the district. So um, obviously there's a lot of uh, COVID going on at the county and we're in the county, so we're not really alone. So any decision that we would make, would, we would have to be mindful of that reality. So with that being said, we have a matrix that's still in place. Uh, we have not moved from green since we adopted it all so long ago. And then the last bit of information is substitute pay rates, a uh, substitute teacher pay rates. Uh, these are our neighbors. Uh, in essence, any district that touches us or we would share subs with, uh, we are sort of right there in the middle of the curve other than the Richmond slightly higher than us. Um, so we're fairly competitive. We have reduced or increased this recently from one uh, 15 up to, I think it was 110 or 115 up to 125 within the last yeah. two years. And lastly, I don't have any magic answers. Here are some ideas that others as of this past Friday are choosing in CESA, increasing their daily rate for substitutes. They're contracting a certain number of subs, meaning you three people, just to give an arbitrary number, you're here every day, report, we'll get you a spot and that, that wouldn't be a problem. We had uh, 17 subs today, eight of those COVID related and four of those were not covered. One teacher wasn't covered and three paras wasn't, weren't, weren't covered. Parent volunteers in classrooms to sub or to aid. Bonuses for subs, certain markers. These are dates again are arbitrary. 10 days, you get a bonus of X dollars. 25 days, 50 days, free lunch for subs and higher substitute rate for Fridays. We tend to have more people out on Fridays. And lastly, paying teachers to cover for teachers. This gets into all sorts of contractual issues. And further, we have to be careful that we don't overtax our teachers who are seeking to cover for others and then we compromise the integrity of the class that they actually are supposed to be in. Because everyone needs a break at some point during their day. And to sub in addition to your regular duties might be a little daunting. So these are just some of the things that others are trying. Uh, one of our neighbors just went virtual as of middle of the afternoon today at the high school. So they have the same sub rate pay as us basically, and they're the same portfolio as us. They're in Polk County. They just, in the, the message basically said, due to sub shortages, they don't have enough teachers. Yeah. And that's effective immediately for effective them? Effective immediately, and they hope to be back on, back here in action on Monday, just at the high school. But I don't, wow. I don't know where it all goes. That is not a lot of notice. I mean, like. They did it over the weekend for today. So, so they did it over the weekend and said you could come to school today, but the rest of the no, week. No, no, the, today they went virtual as of today for oh. high school. Okay. And they're hoped to be back in person next Monday. So they were given the weekend for notice based on my understanding of the message. That's, I mean, it's high school too. That's still not a lot of time. No, I wouldn't say, but no. <clears throat> well, no, I think we've you know done a good job yeah. trying to when we when we were doing that, giving the the notice that we're looking at those things. But obviously, I don't think anybody thinks that that's a grand idea as long as we can to, to not be virtual. So I think we've prided ourselves on giving parents some forewarning, and we've done that via a matrix. There are districts that haven't done a lot of forewarning are making a decision on Wednesday for a Monday. We did that for the better part of a year. Mm -hmm. Now our decision would be for a Friday for a Monday. We've been very telegraphic about posting our cases. I mean, anyone that wants to know at any point in time can just look. Uh, there isn't any secret about it. We're making our decisions based on our own numbers by building. We've made some changes, good changes. You only have so many subs. Uh, today was an okay day because if the record is uh, completely accurate, five of the people that were out today were doing testing at the elementary. So those people were here, they just weren't in the classroom. That's a normal thing we do, testing. You gotta have someone do it, teachers do it. So we were okay today. I don't know what tomorrow looks like. We'll all know about 7.45 tomorrow morning. So do we need to really look at some, one or more of these options to address the sub shortage? You can if you feel that one of these choices would make a difference. I don't know if they would or wouldn't. I mean, I guess I you don't know, know. that's what I'm wondering. Like uh, My estimation based on the taking the pulse of the room on Friday from the CISO 11, 
superintendents. No one's making any changes at this point in time because they don't think any of these things are going to matter. But I can't speak for you, and I certainly can't speak for them. Re re increasing the rate from 125 to 135 is that going to make someone sub here as opposed to subbing Clear Lake? Giving them a free lunch or giving them, I think it would reward the people that are already here, which they deserve a reward by all means. <clears throat> yeah, I think I share that that sentiment. Um, <coughs> that I mean, just it, out of no fault and no blame, we've lost a lot of our older subs that were retired teachers just because of COVID, mm -hmm. um, and that's totally understandable. Um, but then to have teachers that substitutes that do show up um, in lieu of that that same circumstance of COVID um, and being here and taking that risk and and being pretty um, faithful in that, I, I would like to see some kind of uh, incentive to, to keep to keep them here. I mean, obviously, the incentive for them to be here already is that this is they like they like the school district. They like what we have to offer here. They like being in our classrooms. They like being with the students here. Um, it's familiar for them as well. Um, but to see that having a contract of a certain number of substitutes um, each day at, at kind of a long-term rate, um, I think makes a difference, you know, and it's certainly a, an extension of a gratitude for, for the board. If you contract them out, it's a difference of about $100 a day difference. <clears throat> For the amount that they would be paid if you long if you entered into a contract with them then they would be paid at that different rate from moment one so to speak the only item on the here that's a, sorry the difference is a hundred dollars a day if they're long -term. for long term versus short term yes wow if you feel that would make a difference but again i think you're rewarding the folks that are here and yes they deserve a reward i don't think you're picking up new subs and our problem is we need more people to satisfy the fact that we have more people gone. Mm -hmm. If it picks up new people, I, I, don't, I don't think it will, but maybe. The only item on here that's not financial is parent volunteers in the classroom to sub or to aid. If we have parents that are interested in doing that, we would gladly accept them. I mean, there's the ability and the interest to do it issues, but if there are people that are able and willing and want to, absolutely, that's a great idea. And it wouldn't cost us anything but I don't, I don't know if there is or isn't. We haven't asked that question. Um, who would those, we can, oh, sorry. Who would those people need to contact? You, you, would, you can contact the district office. Certainly, we would yep. put you in. Anyone that wants to sub, we would contact the district office um, at extension 272. And then at that point, we would get you patched in with Pam Robarge, and you would get sub jobs. Absolutely. And if they're volunteering, then are, is the DPI requirement for licensing not an issue? I think it would still be an issue because if you're subbing, you have to have a sub license. If you're volunteering, I'm not so sure that this is clean and easy. I don't think you can just be a volunteer. We would have to go through some paperwork on that. Right. And then it ends up being, if it is a sub issue, you, you end up having to pay them. So it does become a financial issue right. at the end of and the day. And they couldn't just, I mean, as a parent volunteer, you can't just step into a classroom and take it over. Not because alone. you need a licensed teacher in the You room. have to have a sub-license. Right. Yep. So it technically, at the end of the day, is not without a cost. I wish yeah. it was. You could help in a classroom, but you yes. can't be the Absolutely the true. We'll always, teacher. And we'll always take help in classrooms, by all means. Like you give me an aid substitute, type, right? Is that what we're getting at? Which comes with a price, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we want to pay our people, but having free options, there's not many of those. Yeah. Having free options. Free options as in we don't have to pay for the coverage of subs. Oh. We right. don't want, we don't have that. What we have to have is less COVID and less absence and less problem. Yeah. But I don't know when that's going to be. 500 cases in three days seems like a lot to me. All right. Well, I kind of scratched off the review of the COVID. We decided, no one decided they wanted to change that matrix or that <coughs> system. Has anybody got any idea on if they want to change the substitute staff? 
I guess, you know, I'm open for hearing from our subs um, or hearing from, you know, as far as suggestions, you know, maybe if we try to look at a higher rate on Fridays, if that's really our day that that is hard to get subs. Right now, it's every day of the week. <laughs> it isn't Fridays. Yeah. In normal times, it would likely be Fridays. Yeah. And I mean, a free lunch would be a nice reward for the sure. people that are here. Sure. But... I don't think that's going to attract new subs, but it would be a nice maybe thank you. Absolutely. Right. No, the cost is small. I don't know that it increases the sub pool, certainly. I don't think yeah. so, but it would be a nice thank you. Sure. And other districts do that. Maybe a bonus. I mean, I don't know. I kind of like the bonus idea for, you know, maybe five days, ten days, whatever mm -hmm. the number is. You could also combine it with, you can track them in for a period of time, you people are, and then you get a bonus <coughs> on X number, certainly. Yeah, I think even if you contracted these, you wouldn't necessarily have to, well, I'm not sure, I guess I shouldn't, I shouldn't say that. Do we have to pay them long-term subpay? Well, you can pay them whatever you want. You can't pay them less than short-term subpay. Right. Right, because I did you a, couldn't, you, you didn't Because the day, the day, once you get past your 11th day, past 10 consecutive days, that's the point at which you need to pay them long-term sub, right? That's typically for things like maternity leave. Is right. that if you're in the same classroom or if you do, if you do, because if you do more 11 than days, 10, you more 11 than 10 days, consecutive sorry. days, you have to move into long-term sub, right? In one assignment. In, in one, one assignment, assignment. Right. Because right. if you did 11 days in a row, you're not necessarily getting long-term pay if that you're switching classrooms. COVID. Typically, it wouldn't. Right. If right. it's a long-term yeah. situation, it's typically going to be a maternity leave right. or and a Because medical then you're leave taking over sort. a lot more of the duties of, of the teacher. You're not just filling in for the day. You're doing lesson plans. You're keeping yep. track of grades. Yes. You're right. you know, you doing all those kinds of things. Bonuses wouldn't necessarily need to be on consecutive days. Right. 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 Yep. Thank you so much for helping us out for 50 days. We greatly appreciate it. Yeah. Right. Whether they were consecutive or not, they're going to get sick themselves. So. Right. Right. Because right. basically, after the 11th day, they are getting that bonus of a long term sub in that assignment. So the other ones are floating all over. They're, sure. They're here the 10, 15 days within two months or whatever. And, and, there should be some kind of a, a thank you of some 25th sort. 25th day, you get 100 bucks or whatever it is. Right, right. Yep. So should we? can we keep talking about that or like? Well, I think what yep. you, well, I would recommend that you simply give me permission to go ahead and institute a plan. We uh, To work out those specifics right now, I think would be right. uh, unrealistic. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> but for me to work with Pam and administrative team to come up with a plan to yes. how to incentivize the sub situation and the way we're talking about. Yeah. 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 Really. And I obviously still being open to parent volunteers um, for, you know, in the classrooms or for subs or aides or things like that. I mean, obviously that would, we always open to that. So. I think one thing you have to be careful of there is if you probably have to do a background check on even volunteers. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Days, you know, some parent calling out upset, do you realize that this parent and they were with my son or daughter? I mean, we still need to stay yeah, and I believe oh, yeah. that's anything that we actually take volunteers for that's going to be working with the students. I think even when I volunteered coach, we had to go through a background check mm -hmm. and things like that. Yeah. So I don't, that wouldn't be anything different. So. Yeah, good point. So, so yeah, yeah it would be nice if you could move <laughs> ahead with putting I will together put some of that and discussing it. Well, I've already put pen to paper. I will do more tomorrow by all means and have it in place rather soon. That sounds great. Okay. Do you want to bring it back to us? On, sure, absolutely. You'll see it in February. Meeting, yeah, if that'd you be would, great, please. Yeah. Okay. All right. Next, donations. Okay. The St. Croix Valley Foundation donated $1,950 to, to the Intermediate School Ukes for Youth Project. Did I say that right? <laughs> yes. Okay, because I've never seen that title before. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Here you What's go. a ute? So, yeah. I was going to ask, should <laughs> yes, we know what please, a ute is? Yes, please, explain. It's ukuleles. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. They're, just, they're ukuleles. Yes. Ukulele. Catherine it's, Bartel wrote. You can kind of see it right here. <laughs> she's our music and band I, teacher. Yeah. She can. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I didn't even look at that. <laughs> yeah. Part of our um, initiative here is to get instruments in students' hands. So Catherine Bartel, who is our band and music teacher, wrote a grant to the St. Croix Valley 
foundation and the the title of the projects was ukes for youth and so with that money we're going to purchase ukuleles for our students to use during wow. during music class super fun cool. yes. why not drums <laughs> we have those oh, actually. Yeah. we Big already did that <laughs> yeah. part of the grant was that the play outside of the no yeah no, no. yeah <laughs> And then the other donation is the Deer Park Lions Club made a donation of $450 to the Angel Fund, which will be split up into the four buildings within the district. Oh. And you would need to make a motion to accept those if you wanted to do so. I will make that motion with a heartfelt thank you to the, the St. Croix Valley Foundation and the Deer Park Lions Club. Yes. We appreciate your support and your donation. To and a second. I'll second. Say. Dale? With a huge thank you to both. That's, yes. that's awesome. Yeah, our angel fund is... is uh... How much is a ukulele? <laughs> I have a ukulele, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? Okay. Well, we have a motion made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? None. Good. And last but not least, personnel. Okay. We have new employee contracts for Riley Johnson, clubhouse assistant or letters of appointment, clubhouse assistant teacher, reassignment, Travis Bauermeister from Montessori teacher to paraeducator, Jana Ullman from paraeducator to Montessori teacher, resignations from Aaron Christensen, special ed para, Jana Ullman, clubhouse worker, Denise Robbins, school nutrition, Jessica Swabati, for clubhouse assistant teacher, and I may need some help from Cheryl to come up and talk about retirement notices from Teresa Haynes and Kathy Peters. I have a little note here from each of those individuals. We've got from Kathy Peters, the number of years in the district, so we've got 27 years of teaching, all of them in Amory, first two years in third grade. And then she was at third grade, when third grade was still at Lean. Then the next year she spent as a second grade teacher. She spent 19 years as a kindergarten teacher. And the last five were spent in the Montessori teacher role by favorite placement with an exclamation point. My favorite moments have been witnessing a child's aha moment. I love it when a child looks at me and with absolute confidence tells me what they have just learned or figured out as they themselves are the first one to have discovered it. I treasure my relationships with my colleagues and being able to share this amazing profession with my daughter. Having her next work next door to me this year has been a gift. And in retirement, I am looking forward to spending more time with my grandchildren and traveling with my husband. Teresa Haynes been in the district 22 years, seven years as a sub, 15 years as a uh, early childhood special education teacher. Favorite memories, when I think of this question, the best memories are always around the Christmas sing-along in the gym with all the children so excited for Christmas. First one, my first year when all the new teachers have to wear reindeer antlers and dance while their kids sing. They're gonna do that at the middle school next year. Second, <laughs> when one of my very d disabled children saw Santa enter the room, he was beyond excited. Third, when one of my children sang Let It Go from Frozen, it brought tears to all the special ed staff and his mother. And of course, I will never forget the staff in some of the fun times we have created over the years. I couldn't have made it without them. Retirement plans, my husband retired in 2020 we plan to do more camping, bike riding, riding in as many states as possible, fishing, spending more time with our grandson, and in general, just enjoying unstructured days. So Brad or Cheryl, if you wanted to speak about either of those two, by all means, have at it. Come on up if you want to, and if you don't want to, it's fine. Kathy and Teresa are superstars. It's going to be really hard to replace them. They are dedicated um, to the children in our school district. They are excellent at everything that they do. And I'm grouping them together because I will have an opportunity at our retirement 
to talk individually about each one of them, and I didn't know I was going to do that this evening, but um, my heart bleeds every time we lose an amazing person in, in, at Leon Elementary School, and they, they are both phenomenal. So thank you so for you, giving me the opportunity to say that welcome. they are amazing. So you really don't want us to approve the resignation? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. No, no, no. I have to say, about a week or two ago, the elementary school staff person that was pitching the hardest for a snow day the next day was Kathy Peters. I'm like, <laughs> interesting. Yeah. We're only three months or four months in the finish, and you want a snow day. Oh, She's man. like one of the seniors. There's something magical about a snow day. <laughs> yeah, I guess. I know. It's very fun. Yeah. 49 years is a lot of combined years there, service yeah. in the district, and a lot of experience that's hard to replace, and that's a lot of dedication, and that's a lot of thank you to both of them. Yes, mm -hmm. yes change but good change for them and we'll we'll make do we'll have to i know every year we see these yeah. wonderful people with such longevity leaving and it <clears throat> it's it's hard to see you should have told them the window was like last <laughs> december they're they very early in the window <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right uh motion to accept personal items i'll make that motion to approve the personal items and a second i'll second Chelsea, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. There we go. And we don't have a need to go into close, so a motion to adjourn. I'll second. All in favor say aye. 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 There we go.